Testing, testing, hello. Testing, testing, hello. Testing, testing, hello. Testing, 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 hello. testing, hello. Testing, testing, hello. Testing, 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 hello. testing, hello. Testing, testing, hello. Testing, hello. 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 Testing, 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 hello. 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 Uh, hey, everybody. Are you ready to do this? Are you ready to go live? Live in five? More about, more like live in two. <coughs> Hold on, let me get my water. Oh, I have not done this in, what, a couple weeks? But I'm ready to parte. So let's pull out, pull up that intro and let's let it rip. Raising consciousness and awakening mankind. This is End of Days Radio. Hello, hello, hello. <clears throat> it's me, it's me, it's the D-A-N, the all-American man broadcasting all the way from the Broken Ruins of Babylon, also known as Seattle, Washington, a.k.a. the itty-gritty Shimmering Emerald City, located in the heart of the Pacific Northwest. How are you, everybody? I am excited to be back for another episode of The End of Days. (coughs) Sorry, I got a little cough. I don't know if I'm coming down with a cold or if I've just been working too hard or what. I know all of you miss me so much. You miss the old me that had time for all kinds of paranormal things and all kinds of fun. And I miss that me too. I absolutely miss that me. But life can get in the way of things. But do not worry. I am still a man on a mission. I am still making the impossible happen. And I am still rapping behind this mic. I'm not actually rapping. That will come later, but we'll see about that. Oh, who do we have on the agenda tonight? Oh, boy. It's none other than Robert Sullivan IV, Freemason and author of Movie Symbiology. I'm excited to talk to him. He's actually working, or he just released a sequel to his first book on cinema symbiology. And we're going to dial him up right now. Let's see if he will answer. Hello. Hey, Daniel, how you doing? Hey, Robert, it has been way too long, my friend. Oh, I agree with you. Thank you so much for inviting me on uh, End of Days Radio. It's great to be back with you. Uh, I've been looking forward to this show for for a while, and uh, I really appreciate you having me on. It's much appreciated. Yeah, absolutely. What's nice about you is you know so much about so many subjects, 
that it's it's we could go on for hours and hours. I don't have hours and hours tonight, but I really want to get into it with you deep tonight. So I, I wanted to just start off by uh, it, it's been a little while since you've been on. So why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself? And if you want to tell us what you've been up to lately, that'd probably be pretty cool, too. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Again, th- thank you for having me on. I think it's been about a year since, since it's been on. Um, the, the, um, well, yeah, well, what, what's happened with me is uh, I, I, I'm the author of two books, The Royal Arch of Enoch and Cinema Symbolism. Uh, these books were originally published. Uh, the Royal Arch came out five years ago. Cinema Symbolism came out three years ago. These books have recently been republished by me. Uh, they are now second editions. I, I am no longer in business with the company uh, that, that was doing the, that, that was distributing the books. I, I'm, I'm no longer in business with them. I founded my own publishing company over the fall of 2016. Uh, I republished Royal Arch of Enoch and I republished Cinema Symbolism. These are second editions. They're, they're the exact same book as uh, the, the earlier edition, um, just with some revisions and re-edits. So um, you know, you know that that happened. What, there were some things that were happening behind the scene that, that necessitated this. Uh, I'm going to keep that somewhat to myself, but but suffice to say, Royal Arch of Enoch, uh, my first book, has been republished. Um, this this documented a Masonic sort of historical anomaly. Um, so that we can get into that a little bit if you want to. Cinema symbolism documents some you know arcane movie imagery. I know you're into that, and I know you were talking to me about getting into that, so that's fine also. Um, I, I republished both of these. The, the print editions are out, the Kindles are out, the e-books are out of these. Um, I recently, within the last month, published my third book, which is called Cinema Symbolism 2, which is a sequel to the first Cinema Symbolism. This book has just come out. This book is brand new. Uh, it's about a month old. Uh, it came out at the beginning of April. Um, the print editions of this are out right now. And uh, uh, the, the e-books, they're about still about a week and a half, two weeks away. They'll be out no later by the end of this month. They'll, they'll be out no later by, by the end of May. Um, so, you know, I, I've, I've been very busy here uh, just, just re, you know, doing the books myself now. They are fantastic. They are the second editions of, of Royal Arch and Cinema Symbolisms are revised, re-edited. They are much better than the first edition. Um, and, you know, the, the second edition or excuse me, the... Uh, the third book, uh, Cinema Symbolism 2, the second movie book is what I was trying to say. That's That was released about a month ago. I'm really pleased with the way that came out. Um, I'm really excited about it, and, and I'm really excited to return to radio. I, I've been off radio since August of last year. Um, again, this was intentionally done by me to... Um, to just, I needed the time to, um, to republish the books, to get them ready, to get them out there. Um, there was a time... Uh, there was a time going back to around mid-November of last year to November of 2016 where both my books, Royal Arch and Cinema Symbolism, were off the market entirely. You couldn't buy the print edition. You couldn't buy the ebook. Um, and like I said, this this was due to the fact that I was no longer in business with the company that I was using. So at any rate, to, to just you know make a long story a little bit longer, I, I republished both my books. I, I founded a publishing company. Royal Arch of Enoch is out there. This is available you know, on every just about online distributor out there, Amazon, Books a Million, Barnes and Noble, the ebooks of that's been released. Same likewise with Cinema Symbolism. That's out there, the print edition, the the ebooks, you can get that. Cinema Symbolism too, like I said, is out there. The print edition, you can get that right now. Amazon, Books a Million, Barnes and Noble. It's on various global distributor websites. Uh the ebooks for that though are still about two weeks away. Um, no later than the end of the month. So that's what I've been up to. And uh, like I said, I, I appreciate you inviting me on. Uh, you know, I, I, I got your invite whenever it was a couple months ago. And at that point in time, I believe I was still republishing the first two books. I said, hey, let me get these out and get Cinema Symbolism 2 out and we'll set something up. And uh, at any rate, here I am back on End of Days Radio. And uh, it's my pleasure to be here. So like I said, you know, uh, we've got a couple hours or, you know, an hour and a half, whatever you want to take it to, an hour and a half, two hours. And uh, you ask me whatever you want to. Okay, excellent. Yeah, sorry to hear that uh, there was a falling out between you and the publisher, but it sounds like you're in a better place now. So hats off to you, and you're doing a sequel to Cinema Symbolism. So I take it the first book must have done pretty well. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was just a um, it was just a situation that, like I said, necessitated itself. It's okay, and I'm okay. Um, I was the one who orchestrated the 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 end of the relationship. So everything was, you know, everything's okay. Yeah, I mean, um, 
The Royal Arch did well. Cinema Symbolism did well. Both books sold very well. Both books were bestsellers. At least the Kindle versions were, so I can't complain. And um, Cinema Symbolism 2 was really something I had been planning um, for, for, for really when the first book came out. Cinema Symbolism 2 was really a lot of movies that I wanted to incorporate or contain or talk about in the first book, but the book would have just gone on forever. You know, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't just put all this information in. I mean, the first, the first cinema symbolism is 462 pages. Cinema symbolism two is actually 688. So, um, yeah, it was just a ton more movies. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm working, I, I'm, I was working on another book simultaneously with it. My first work of fiction that, that I've just picked up again, um, that, that I've been working on. Um, in earnest since about uh, March of this year. I'm, I'm really happy with the way that's coming out. I'm writing that right now. Um, but I should be done that in about, you know, probably over the summer. And hopefully I'm going to do everything I can in my power to get that out before Christmas. We'll see. But um, yeah, Cinema Symbolism and Royal Arch did well. And uh, like I said, I've got the, the Cinema Symbolism 2 that's been out. And I'm working on my first work of fiction. And I'm actually uh, Dan uh, started outlining Cinema Symbolism 3 and uh, another book on Freemasonry. So, uh, yeah, I've got plenty here on my plate. Oh, you're but, actually um, working like said, on a – sorry, yeah, you're actually on, working sorry, on another – so, sorry. Yeah, you're actually working on another Freemason book. That's exciting. Yeah, that's uh, – the, the working title of that is called Freemasonry and the Path to Babylon. That's, to be honest with you, probably a few years away still. But um, I've started outlining it. I've, I've definitely written on it. But um, – Right now, I'm working on my first work of fiction. That's my number one priority. After that's done, we'll see what happens. It's either going to be Cinema Symbolism Three or this or this other or this other book on Freemasonry. Awesome. And you know, one thing about me is I love to read. I don't always have tons of time, but I'm a huge book fan. One of these days, I gotta send you a, a text of a picture of my bookshelf so you can see how stuffed it is. But I absolutely love books. And let me ask you, Robert, are, are you like me? Do you miss the old fashioned bookstore? Oh, absolutely. Um, it's funny. It's funny you mentioned that because you know it. It is. I love books. I have a very. I'm sure, like you, I have a very vast library here as you know well. Um, he, you know, in, in, I'm, I'm a, I mean, I'm not a millennial, I'm a generation Xer and, uh, I grew up, I was born in 1971 and I remember walking around shopping malls and, uh, you know, there was always these stores in there like Walden Books, B. Dalton, uh, there was, uh, uh Brentano's, you went in any shopping mall and you, you found one of these and then of course you had Borders Books, they were popular for a while. Um, unfortunately, with the advent of the Internet and, and Amazon.com, um, these stores all went out of business in, in the mid 2000s. By around 2006, 2007, these stores were all completely gone. Um, so, you know, I walk around old shopping malls now here in Baltimore uh, and, and I remember seeing these stores and now they're all completely gone. And, yeah, I mean, I miss that. I, I always used to go in them and uh, I miss that. And uh, like I said, I had a Borders here. That's gone. They, they went out of business. That, that was in one spot. They moved to another, but eventually closed up. Um, I mean, the only really bookstores you have now are like used bookstores. And uh, I certainly go in them. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's 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 you know, it is. It's, it's like a thing of the past, really, because you really, you know, most people, I, I suspect, buy all their books online now. And uh, it's it's really kind of done in, you know, the bookstore. And it, I'm with you. I miss it, you know. And, and the the only thing I have here in Baltimore now, there's a Barnes and Noble that's uh, not too far away from me. Um, and uh, you know, there's some used bookshops, but certainly not like what it used to be. Not not like it was in the 80s and 90s. That's for cert certain. And certainly not in the shopping mall. Like I said, always there was always a Walden Books or B. Dalton or a Brentano's, and they they are long gone. Yeah, that's very interesting to me. Would would you mind sharing with us? some of your favorite books from your collection? Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Uh, great question. Um, I would say, you know, when, when I'm writing my books, um, you know, the, the, the books that I sort of, I guess, one, you know, the, some of my top favorite books, um, I would definitely say are the works of like Manly P. Hall. Uh, the Secret Teachings of All Ages is, is very good. I really like that. Um, I like the Albert Pike book, Morals and Dogma of the Scottish Rite. That's very good. A, a lot of symbolic history there. Um, th you know, I'm trying to think. Uh, I, I have some books on uh, Tarot here. Um, one of my favorite books on, on the Tarot cards, Tarot cards, is a book just simply titled uh, The Tarot by Richard Cavendish. Um, that is probably by far and away my favorite book on, on the Tarot. 
Um, the reason I like that book so much, it, he really covers so much in it. He gets into the history. He gets into the interpretations. But not only does he get into the interpretations, he gets into like, you know, in the Renaissance, it meant, you know, the card meant this. To Aleister Crowley, the card meant this. To the Golden Dawn, the card meant this. In a reading, it could mean this. He really gets thorough with it. So um, The Tarot by Richard Cavendish is another one of my favorite books. Um, there, There's a fantastic book. I bought it. When I was in England in 1992, it had just been published. And I was just very drawn to the book. Um, and it was very expensive at the time because it was only put out in England and it was put out li in a limited release. I'm, I'm sure you can find this book online, um, at, you know, online used at this point in time. I, th I think it's out of print, but I'm sure you can find online, you know, online a uh, used version of it. It's called The Art and Architecture of Freemasonry by a man named James Stephen Curl. That book is very good. Um, you know, and that's another one that I rely on, um, you know, when I've been writing my books. So, yeah, I mean, I, I have um, a wide range. I have a library here, a wide range of books, history books. I was a history major at college, so I have a vast library. I'm sure like you, I definitely like to see a picture of yours. And, of course, I have a, uh, a cult selection as well. And, of course, they've been uh, key to helping me write all three of my books. So, yeah, I mean, th those are some of my favorites at any rate. What What is it about? Well, let me preface this question a little bit. I've sure. been somewhat interested in tarot cards. I even bought a deck of Aleister Crowley tarot cards from the used bookstore. When I pulled them out, they, they smell like seven layers deep of some old lady cigarettes. But it was, right. yeah, it was fun to kind of play around with them. But, but my question would be, do you feel that the tarot system works? And why do you like it so much? Right. Um for me, I, I'm much more interested. I, 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 for me personally, I'm less interested in like divination, the divination of the cards. I mean, obviously, that's probably. I'm like you. I have a used copy here or used deck of the Raider of the uh, Rider Weight deck. I, I have like two of them here. And like you, you know, I, I probably bought it like at a flea market or a used bookstore along the way. And same thing. It's yellow and probably you know used and all that um i i use the the tarot tarot cards for me come into my research um less from a divination standpoint than more from a symbolic um standpoint i i am much more interested for me personally by the imagery on the cards and what what the imagery symbolizes um th then i probably am using the deck in in fortune telling or something like that uh, obviously i'm fully aware that the deck can be used for that purpose and that is obviously the you know one of its main functions i completely get that but for me and in my research i am much more interested on the symbols on the cards and what they symbolize um and the i guess really for me it's the archetypal imagery this is what, you know, people like Carl Jung talk about, the archetypal imagery embedded on the cards, because like in my research, um, and I may have mentioned this on the show, I mean, a lot a lot of the cards, especially when you're dealing with the main or major arcana cards, you know, th this is the archetypes. I mean, the, this is this is some of the characters that you'll find in movies. This is what I talk about, like in, you know, the movie books. So, for instance, you have the hermit. Um, you have the hermit tarot card, uh, you know, you know, th this is, this is the Gandalf figure in, um, you know, the old gray beard. This is Gandalf in Lord of the Rings. This is Kenobi in Star Wars. This is Albus Dumbledore in Harry Potter. So for me, it's really just studying and examining the archetypal symbolic images on the card. That's, that's what's really key to my research. What do you think of? A lot of these Christian people that feel like anything that is a cult, tarot cards, anything is evil. What, what do you think about all of that? Is that mind control? What's going on there? Right. Well, uh, I guess it, it's a good question. Um, you know, I mean, certainly, I guess it depends on your blend of Christianity. Um, you know, I, I'm a Freemason. Um, certain Christian groups denounce Freemasonry as the occult. I really don't. I think it has occult components in it, but I don't necessarily see it as evil. I don't know if I'd go so far as to say it's mind control or, 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 or if, if a Christian wants to believe it's mind control. I certainly don't believe that. Um, I kind of really, with my research, I present the material. I try not to dictate to anybody what to do or think. Um, you know, I just present the material. Um, certainly within f certain blends of Christianity, you have, um, 
you know, I mean, denouncement of this stuff. I mean, I, you know, that that's fine. That's their right. That's their priority. It's certainly not anything I, I agree with, per se. I mean, you get into Christian dogma. I mean, I believe that, you know, you, you take a look at the word occult. Um, the word the word actually comes from the Latin occultus, just meaning hidden. It just means to hide. It's hidden. I mean, I know it has this connotation of meaning witchcraft or demonism or something like that. That's more of a modern day, um, you know, kind of reading of the word. The word occult just means hidden. And certainly when you get into I mean, and this is what I talk about in the Royal Arch of Enoch book. Um, you know, you know, when you get into like, you know, you know, the Old Testament and, and even the New Testament, I think I think, you know, for, for me, at any rate, my research is, you know, a, a lot of religious groups, a lot of what you would call the Abrahamic faiths, you know, Judaic, Christian, Islamic, you know, religions read this stuff as completely literal. Um, I do not necessarily agree with that. I think it should be looked at more as, you know, you know, especially the stories of the Bible as symbolic. Um, as not as literal history. I mean, you you can always interpret it that way or even blend the two together. But I think um, that a lot of the stories of the Bible are allegorical and metaphorical. So, you know, and they contain hidden meaning. So you could even say these these stories have an occult meaning and that would not have any negative connotation, at least in my interpretation of it. So, um, you know, you know, as far as, you know, I would say fundamentalist Christian groups denouncing it as mind control. I mean, you could say, look, you know, that religion also has, you know, very strict dogma as well. And, and you know, can be very controlling, um, depending on what blend of it, you know, you're talking about. Certainly there are Christian, you know, groups and organizations that are very mild. Um, there are Christians who join Freemasonry and think nothing of it. Um, you know, now, now on, on the other end of the spectrum, I've talked to Christians who are friends of mine who have refused to join Freemasonry or have joined in, dropped out saying, oh, this is too mystical. This is too esoteric for me. So it's really, I guess, your blend of Christianity. But like, you know, in, in, in the Royal Arch of Enoch book, for instance, my first book, I mean, I talk about how I believe, you know, I analyze, I suppose that's the better word, um, how a lot of the stories in the scriptures in the Old and New Testament are, are better understood as allegorical and not literal. Yeah, I think that's a really good way to look at it. Like the story of Adam and Eve, that's representative of so many different things of uh, a spiritual evolution of some kind, isn't it? Well, certainly that's that's one way of looking at it. I mean, you could say, I mean, absolutely. Um, you know, I get into more of like the Jesus story. You know, and, and, you know, like, for instance, um, you know, the New Testament, the story of Jesus, Jesus being a medical for stand in for the sun. We have a lot of Neoplatonic imagery, deal, you know, coming out of this twining pagan themes with Christianity, the 12 apostles, the 12 houses of the Zodiac, death and resurrection. Certainly you have these themes in the Old Testament as well. The, the exodus with Moses, for instance, the leaving of the, the slave land for the Holy Land. This is, again, you know, the Passover. You know, this ties into the vernal equinox. This is why Passover is celebrated at the time of the vernal equinox. Jesus, uh, the, 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 the resurrection of Jesus is celebrated by the, the, at this exact same time. Um, the, the, you know, people don't, you don't realize this, uh, Daniel, but of course, the, the celebration of Easter and Passover move around. It's not on the same day every year. A lot of Jews and Christians are completely oblivious to this and they don't know why. Um, the, the festival of Passover and Easter is celebrated by the placement of the sun and the moon in the sky. Um, it has to do with the first full moon after the vernal equinox and the first Sunday. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of Christians and, and Jews do not understand that their own religion is dictated by the moon and the sun. Um, the, the Adam and Eve story certainly, again, could be viewed as allegorical. Um, I mean, certainly you, anytime you're dealing with the tree of wisdom and it's, you know, you know, equal the tree of life, you're dealing with Hebrew Kabbalah right off the bat. The whole idea of the apple being a sephira of the um, Kabbalistic tree, the biting of it being the consumption of wisdom, a.k.a., um, you know, you know, the, the, the serpent, um, you know, supplying the wisdom, the serpent being a symbol of wisdom in, in many in many religions. And, you know, even in Jesus says, you know, be as wise as serpents. Um, and, and, you know, the, the whole idea also of, of the serpent and the serpent in the tree, you're dealing with the idea of the caduceus of Hermes or Hermes Trismegistus. So again, another wisdom bringer. So yeah, I mean, I mean, the whole, the whole notion of the Adam and Eve story of supplying wisdom, supplying gnosis, um, can certainly be looked at as allegorical and not literal. I mean, it's, it's, it's odd because in, in that story, you were told, um, 
you know, I mean, you know, you're, you're told, okay, Adam and Eve are the first two people. And then, you know, they, they had the whole incident with the apple, you know, the, or the, the forbidden fruit, I suppose is the better word. Then they're cast out and then they, they, they have children, Cain and Abel. And then of course you have where Cain kills Abel, then he's cast out. And I believe at some point they say, well, then Abel found other people. Well, immediately you should be asking yourself, you know, where, where the hell did these other people come from all of a sudden? Um, you know, where did, where did they come from? So, um, you know, for me, I suppose, you know, you know, and I talk about this, if you're interested in what I'm talking about, by far and away, check out my first book, The Royal Arch of Enoch, because I believe um, that a lot of the stories in the book of the Bible, a lot of the Bible stories can be viewed as allegorical um, and, and are, are not meant to take them, be taken literally. And indeed, Daniel, you will even find this with a lot of the people who are composing this material. Um, for example, um, one of the chief compilers of the New Testament, a man by the name of Origen, hints in his writing that there are two doctrines of Christianity, one symbolic and one literal, 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 excuse me, and the literal interpretation is basically for the lay masses. The symbolic hidden meaning is for the, you know, initiated masters. So this is not uncommon. And like I said, um, I believe, you know, that a thorough examination of this, you know, could, could the characters in the Bible have been based on real people? Sure. Of course. I mean, I wasn't there. I don't know, but I believe when you, when you start breaking down the stories of the Bible, you will find this completely allegorical. I um, mean, this really comes as no surprise because you will find that a lot of the people who are putting these stories together and, you know, especially when it comes to the new Testament, you know, we're, we're, you know, the, the, the night council and I see a lot of pagans who are just incorporating the old solar, you know, in the, you know, mystery school doctrines into the New Testament. So none of this is really all too surprising. Um, again, could these characters have been, you know, real people? You know, of course it's possible, but I believe the Bible, a lot of those stories are, are completely metaphorical and allegorical. How about the existence of Jesus himself? Right. Well, I mean, you know, it, that's, again, very debatable. Um, up until the Council of Nicaea in around 322, there was different groups that viewed Jesus as, as many different things. Um, some people viewed him as a, as a real living person. Other people, such as the Gnostics, had viewed, had viewed Jesus as a spiritual force. Um, you know, you, you even now in modern day Christian, Christianity have the doctrine of the two bodies of Christ. Um, granted, this is a bit of a heresy and you know, you'll find this in the doctrine of St. or the gospel of St. John, the idea of two bodies of Christ, one physical, one spiritual. Um, this ties into Gnostic thought as well. Um, many, even Christians believed Jesus was a spiritual entity and that story was not meant to be taken literal. Um, certainly a lot of the gospel stories, these were augmented over the years. I mean, and again, you'll find a lot of solar allegory with this, the death and resurrection, the 12 apostles, um, you know, the crucifixion. Um, you know, I mean, there's just so many symbolic aspects of the story of Jesus. Again, could there have been a real person running around um, 2000, you know, 2017 years ago? Of course, I wasn't there. Um, but, you know, when, we, when you break it down and you look at the, the historians at the time, um, there's really no mention of this guy, uh, of a Messiah figure. Um, the, 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 the Joseph, Josephus story, the antiquity of the Jews, that's debatable. He mentions lots of Jesus figures in that. So, you know, that, that has to be the, the antiquity of the Jews by Josephus has to be taken with a grain of salt. Um, you have, you have really Nicene Christianity coming on the scene in the 320s. This is, a, you know, 320 years after Jesus was alleged to have lived. So, I mean, these guys are just making this stuff up as they go. Um, and these guys who are putting this religion together are essentially Emperor Constantine, who was, you know, a pagan. And all these guys are doing is just relying on the old, you know, you know, the Sol Invictus, Mithraism, cults of Eleusis, Osirian mystery schools to crave Christianity. I mean, that's why you find so many parallels with these pagan solar religions that, that you do in Christianity. Again, could there have been a historic figure? I wasn't there. It's possible. There is a guy who fits the bill by the name of Joshua Ben Gamala. Um, he certainly was around at that time. He was a Jewish rebel um, and a rabbi. So he he could be a, you know, a candidate for the historic Jesus. Whether this person existed is debatable. And certainly whether he was of divine origin is certainly debatable. Um, I do not like to shove my religious beliefs down people's throats. So I leave it to the listener to decide. But if you're interested in, in a symbolic interpretation of the Bible, which I believe it is, um, you know, I believe those stories are very, very allegorical. 
Um, and you will even find, and this is critical this, to this research as well, um, and this is something I thoroughly document in the first book, The Royal Arch of Enoch, is you will actually find an influence of the Book of Enoch um, on the New Testament. And, and that is really key to all this, because the, the Book of Enoch is sort of like this, I described this on other shows as well, as sort of the solar astrological key that when you understand it kind of unlocks and decodes um, the New Testament almost. So was there real people? Yeah, I guess it's possible. But I mean, all the, the all those stories of the virgin birth, the death and resurrection, certainly the Christian holidays, which are all based on the sun, um, the movement of the sun. I mean, Christmas is the winter solstice. Easter is the vernal equinox, the death and resurrection of the sun. That's pretty irrefutable. Um, and uh, like I said, my interpretation is that it should be looked at allegorically and symbolically, not necessarily literally. But could there have been real people since I wasn't there? It's certainly possible. Okay, are you ready for a curveball? Yeah, go ahead, throw it at me. All right, this is going to be a really weird question. <laughs> okay, go so ahead. one of the big things in paranormal, conspiracy, et cetera, et cetera, and my listeners are going to know already what I'm going to get into, but one of the biggest things you see on YouTube is this whole flat earth thing, and the Freemasons are being blamed for tricking the world into th yeah tricking the world into thinking that the earth is round uh, what do you think of that is it just uh, nonsense or, or is there anything there well to me it sounds like it's total nonsense i can't even fathom i I've, I've heard i've heard about this i don't really follow it i i can't possibly fathom that there's anyone left who believe that the world that the world is flat anymore um, i mean i think this is pretty well been all discarded i mean you have newtonian science that that can kind of disproves this um i mean you know you have the whole idea of the the earth rotating around the sun i believe this has all been pretty well discarded uh you know galileo and isaac newton and copernicus four or five hundred years ago i can't possibly fathom that um anyone um believes that the earth is flat anymore i'm a freemason uh, this is news to me i'm certainly not tricking anyone i don't believe myself that the earth is flat so um you know, I don't know any Freemason, to be honest with you, who believes anymore that the Earth is flat. I, I can't even fathom that. Um, you could see the curvature of the Earth if you go up high enough. Um, you know, you know, you could you could see it with your own naked eye. Get up in an airplane, and you'll be able to see the curvature of the Earth. If the Earth wasn't curved, you would be able to get up on, into a high enough building um, and and see everything. If you had enough, if you had a, a powerful telescope. I mean, I'm in Baltimore. If I was to go to a tall enough building. Um, I should be able to take a, a high powered lens and be able to see the spires of Philadelphia, let's say, if I look northward or, or even New York, because if the earth was flat, there would be nothing impeding me. Um, we know this is not the case. And the reason this can't be done is because the earth is round. Um, you can only see so far because um, of the bend of the earth. So um, I don't believe the earth is flat. I don't know any Freemasons who believe the earth is flat. flat. Um, I guess a person can believe whatever they want to. Um, but, you know, I've been involved with Freemasonry for 20 years now. Um, I have been accused of many things, um, you know, of being a reptilian included. Um, and I probably would be more willing to believe that um, than I am, that, that I'm some sort of a reptilian shapeshifter than in the earth is flat. So, um, you know, I've been involved with Freemasonry since 1996, 97. I've been in the Scottish Rite. Uh, since 1999, I, I don't really, I got to be honest with you, Daniel, I don't really follow this too much on YouTube. I've have heard about this a little bit. So I'm not going to lie and say, Oh, I don't know what you're talking about. I have heard some of this. But um, I, I know I do not believe the earth is flat. And I know of no Freemasons that believe the earth is flat, or if they do, they're lying to me, I suppose. Um, so, you know, I do not believe the earth is flat. I think science has pretty well discarded this. But um, I hope that answers your question. That's really the best way I can answer it. Um, and uh, as a Freemason, I do I am not tricking anyone into believing that the uh, Earth is flat. I have no problem answering asking you asking me that though. It's uh, always like to get into different subjects uh, on these shows. And uh, my my understanding of it is that the whole flat Earth thing has been discarded, disproved, uh, you know, two, three, four hundred years ago. And uh, I don't know too many people anymore who really believe the Earth is flat. Okay, and my next question, the, the Mormon church is often compared to Freemasonry. I think there's some links there somewhere in the past. 
Uh, could you tell us about your opinion of Mormonism, if you have one? Yeah, no, no, no. This there is some truth to. Um, the the founders of the Mormon religion, um, you know, this this is gets me into some trouble with the Royal Arch of Enoch book. I mean, and this this is definitely somewhat of a taboo subject. I don't mind talking about it. I'm not an expert on it, but I do talk about it in the Royal Arch of Enoch. A lot of the, the Brigham, Brigham Young and uh, Joseph Smith were both Freemasons. They are the founders of the Mormon religion. Um, and there is some nexus. A lot of the rituals of Mormonism do parallel Freemasonry. Um, the, you know, the whole idea of the construction of a, of a, of a new temple, um, on the Holy Mount, um, the, the whole, this parallels the, the whole idea of in the, in the high degrees of the construction of the second temple, um, on the Holy Mount and sort of this restoration of this divine godly kingdom. You will, you will definitely find parallels in, um, in Mormonism with Freemasonry. Um, there is truth to this. Um, this, this isn't a conspiracy or, or anyone talking wildly. Um, there is definitely parallels with uh, Freemasonry and the Mormon religion. Like, again, Daniel, I don't really consider myself an expert on it. Um, I do talk about it in the Royal Arch of Enoch book, but you will definitely find the whole idea in Mormonism of this sort of restoration of this temple mount, of the temple, the third temple on the Holy Mount, trying to bring about this divine kingdom. You will definitely completely find parallels with this in the high degrees of Freemasonry. Um, with, with uh, you know, the whole idea of the, the restoration of the Temple of Zerubbabel, the, the restoration of this hidden subterranean treasure vault, and this whole idea of sort of the restoration of divine providence um, by Freemasonry in this, in this high degree ceremonial, which you will find paralleled in the Mormon church. Um, and, and, you know, you, you will just you will find, you know, parallels with the Mormon religion, some of the rituals parallel Freemasonry. Um, this has been documented. Um, but again, this really isn't too alarming because um, the, the Mormon religion um, was founded by Freemasons. Brigham Young and Joseph Smith were both both active Masons. So, you know, you, you, you can't be all too surprised when, um, you know, you, you, you will find a parallel within Freemasonry with Mormonism. Um, there, there is definitely smoke to that fire. No question about it. Cool. And earlier you brought up the Kabbalah. I'm not really very educated on Kabbalah. Do you know a lot about it? Could you tell us a little bit about it? Sure. I probably, I, I don't consider, like, again, I, you know, I don't know. I'm an expert in Freemasonry and movie symbolism, but certainly Hebrew Kabbalah ties and Christian Kabbalah ties into this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I definitely give you an overview for this. Um, Hebrew Kabbalah is a, 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 well, if you to be believed, is um, it, it, this can get a bad rap again. It not necessarily should, though. It is an oral doctrine transmitted to Moses and the Hebrew prophets coming straight from God. Um, God apparently if you believe the story transmitted Kabbalah, it's a secret doctrine to a lot of the Jewish prophets um, orally, and it's an oral tradition. It has to do with um, the Sephirot and these 32 paths of wisdom, which are all emanations of deity. Um, the Tarot ties into this. There are 22 paths. There are uh, 10 Sephirot. Um, so you have 22 major arcana of the Tarot. Um, you have 22 paths of the um of, of the Hebrew Kabbalah. This was Christianized um, in, in the Renaissance by people like Giovanni Pico de la Mandarola. I know that's a mouthful. Matt Marcillo, or excuse me, Marsilio uh, Ficino, uh, Raymond Lully. These were all early Christian Kabbalists. Um, and this is, of course, when you get into the Christian version of it, this is one of my pet peeves. Um, there are three versions. There are three spellings of Kabbalah. There's Kabbalah with a K. That's the Hebrew version. That's sort of the Hebrew mystery school. Then you have Kabbalah with the C, which is the Christian version of it. This is essentially the exact same thing as Hebrew Kabbalah, only the emanation of deity is Jesus Christ. And then you have Kabbalah with a Q, which is sort of the hermetic occult version of it. But they all intertwine. They're all interrelated. Um, and of course, the whole idea is if you study this, you're studying divinity, you're studying God, you're becoming closer to, to, um, to, 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 to God, to, to a godly figure. Um, you know, and it's, it's through Kabbalah. It's, it's a Hebrew system. It's a very Hebrew, um, it's a very complex Hebrew system of magic. Um, through this, you get forms of alchemy golem making the insertion of life into um lifeless 
um, uh, lifeless forms, um, the idea of a, of, a, of a Kabbalistic golem. Of course, you know, in cinema, this is Frankenstein's monster, Edward Scissorhands, Smurfette, you name it. These things are all over the place. Um, Christian Kabbalah, uh, you know, Kabbalah also has an angelic and demonic hierarchy. And of course, you'll find this in the works of people like John Dee and Edward Kelly. Um, this ties into Freemasonry. You will, you, you, you know, in a case, this ties into what we were talking about earlier with the Bible, with, um, you know, the, the, the whole idea of the, the, the tree of life and the tree of, um, wisdom being emanations of Hebrew Kabbalah, biting from it is symbolically studying it. So you're becoming, you know, this is why God forbids it because you're becoming like him. And of course, God doesn't want you treading on his territory. So yeah, um, and again, you get into Freemasonry with this, you have, you know, the 32 degrees of Scottish Rite, you have 32, um, you get the number 32 when you add up the, the Sephirah. And the 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 um the the different pet the twenty two paths you know t- ten plus twenty two is thirty two then you have a hidden sephirot called Dath which is all the other sephirot combined then you add that you get the number thirty three hence you get the thirty three degrees of the Scottish Rite um and you know you'll definitely find parallels with um Hebrew Kabbalah and and Freemasonry this is irrefutable so yeah it's it's a blend of Hebrew mysticism. Um, occultism, Gnosticism, um, and you will find different forms of this Christian, you know, people Christianized it in, in the Renaissance. Um, it's, it's a form of Christian mysticism as well. Um, and it definitely ties into Freemasonry. Um, and again, I, I talk about this much more in my first book, The Royal Arch of Enoch. So yeah, I mean, um, it's an interesting study. And, uh, you know, it, you get into, it ties into a lot. Um, you know, you get into, um, you know, a lot of archetypal imagery with this. You know, especially when you're dealing with the tarot. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, there, there's definitely a nexus with it. And uh, it's a fascinating study. And we could talk about it all night. I'm just going to wrap up on that. But it ties into a lot of um, Western mysticism. Uh, Hebrew Kabbalah does. That's uh, irrefutable. And another topic, another topic that you brought up earlier that I wanted to touch on a little bit, because it sounds like you know quite a bit about it, is Gnosticism. How does Gnosticism tie into Freemasonry and, well, yeah, how does it tie into Freemasonry? Do a lot of Freemasons believe in Gnosticism? Well, I would say, I would answer you, there, there are Gnostic components of Freemason, in Freemasonry. I think that's irrefutable. Um, whether other Freemasons buy into that, I mean, or are practicing Gnostic, you'd have to ask them. Um, you know, when it comes to religious belief in Freemasonry, the, the requirement is that you believe in a supreme being. So if you are a free, if you are a Gnostic and you believe in a supreme being, um, certainly the, the supreme being in Gnosticism, the spiritual supreme being is what's generally referred as the monad. Um, you would have no problem joining Freemasonry. If you, if you're Jewish and you believe in a supreme being and you want to call this entity Yahweh or Jehovah, that's fine. Um, as long as you believe in a supreme being, you're fine to join Freemasonry. You know, certainly if you're a Christian, you believe in Jesus Christ, no problem. If you're a deist like I am and you believe in a God figure, or a supreme being, no problem. Um, there are Gnostic components in Freemasonry. And, you know, for example, um, when you join the Blue Lodge, I mean, you know, the whole idea is you're undergoing a symbolic death and resurrection through Masonic ritual. So the whole idea is, I mean, you, you'll hear this term thrown around all the time. I mean, you, you may have heard it yourself in your travels. Um, and people listening may have heard this term being brought from uh, darkness to light. Um, and the idea is that before Freemasonry, you were kind of, you know, ignorant. You, you, you were in living in a state of darkness through Freemasonry and through improving yourself in Freemasonry. That's another catchphrase you'll hear from time to time. You go undergo this symbolic death and resurrection. Again, where have you seen this before? You know, you're brought from darkness to life. You're killed and brought back to life. You know, you know, it's a it's a parallel of the Osirian Egyptian religion. Of course, in Christianity, it's the death and resurrection of Jesus um, and where the Freemason undergoes this symbolic death and resurrection. And of course, this is all very Gnostic. Um, the whole idea behind this is you're being brought from darkness to light, enlightenment. You're, you're undergoing, a, you, you know, you were ignorant and now you're being brought to a form of wisdom. And of course, this is what Gnosticism teaches. Um, I mean, the word gnosis literally means to know. It means knowledge. Um, so, so, you know, you have this whole idea of your, your divine spark um, has been reawakened. You're brought into this, you know, you're being reborn in this sort of Gnostic um, form where you're being brought from darkness to light. Your, your old self is dead. You're now reborn. 
and and they're, they're this, they're, this is very Gnostic. Um, this is definitely a Gnostic element within Freemasonry. That now you're improved. That you're no longer the person you were before. You're you're brought into the light, light enlightenment. You're now enlightened, and uh, you know now you can improve yourself, and by improving yourself, improve the community and improve other people. You know, it can improve the community at large is what I'm trying to say. So you know. Um, you know, when you get into Gnosticism, you will definitely find Gnostic um, elements in Freemasonry. I'll just wrap up on this. Um, and again, you know, just just ties into my other two books, the cinema books. You'll find Gnostic um, themes in movies all over the place. Um, and, you know, you, you, it, it's, a, it's a deep study. You get into the, you know, when it comes to Gnosticism, you're really dealing with three fountainheads of theory or philosophy. Um, you know, the three main Gnostic thinkers are Valentinus, Manny, and Basilidus. They all intertwine. Um, their, their philosophies, their, their theology, that's probably the better word. Um, and I get into this much more in the, in the movie books and how their different strains turn up in film. But just generally speaking, when you're dealing with, you know, with, with Freemasonry, you know, which was really what your question was, the whole idea of being brought from darkness to light, this ties into the, the, the philosophies, the theology of a Gnostic teacher, Manny, who, you know, this is sort of Zoroastrian dualism, this whole idea of light versus darkness, ignorance versus wisdom. So, yeah, there is this very deep Gnostic theme going on inside the Blue Lodge, in the Blue Lodge rituals, where the candidate, if you join Freemasonry like I have, you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about, where you undergo the symbolic death, your old self is gone, you're brought into the light, and you're, you know, you're, you're resurrected, as it were, into this new enlightened being. Um, and, uh, you know, you're able to affect positive change in yourself and in the community. That's the theory behind it. Awesome. And which movies, are there any movies out there that you would say are just full of Gnostic elements or would be good representations of Gnosticism? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I document this all over the place. I mean, if you wanted to see Gnostic cinema, my goodness gracious, where to begin? Um, the Matrix movies, the first Matrix movie is, is Gnosticism 101. Um, Gnosticism teaches a false reality that materialism is no good, that the re reality is, 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 you know, that, you know, that there's a materialistic reality created by a, a lesser God known as the Demiurge. And this needs to be shrugged off. This, this is an illusion. The reality is an illusion. So you have the whole idea of, of, I mean, in the matrix of the real world being a false creation and illusion of the Demiurge. You have to shred it off. And then once you shred it off, you're enlightened. You're brought to the real world, spiritual enlightenment. But the, the entire, the entire ma first matrix movie is the Gnostic religion on film. You will have, um, I mean, you have the whole idea of the demiurge, the creator of the material world, the creator of the false reality. Um, if you're into Gnostic thought, the, the demiurge, the lesser God has, um, the, these, these sort of angels and demons that do his bidding. They're known as the archons. Um, these turn up as the matrix, as the agents who are always trying to enforce the will of the, of the demiurge, the architect. He doesn't turn up till, till the second. Um, I mean, what a name to give this guy, the architect. I mean, the, the, the fashioner of the false reality. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the Matrix movie is Gnosticism. I mean, the Truman Show with Jim Carrey. You have Kristoff as the demiurge, the crafter of the phony reality. You have, you know, the Jim Carrey, Carrey figure trying to seek spiritual enlightenment. I mean, just his name alone, Truman being the true man trying to, you know, spiritually develop himself and shut off the the phony world so yeah i mean i mean not there there is a whole study on gnostic cinema um i'm just naming two two of the big movies you know that really come to mind when it comes to gnostic thought fight club would be another one um with brad pitt and ed norton the whole idea of again the destruction of the material world for spiritual gnosis um this the the, the first the, the fight club movie actually ties this in with secret societies as well um where you have the the tyler durden character and and the narrator shredding off or shrugging off the material world um and it's the destruction of the material world and they're doing this through destruction of themselves so it's the destruction of the physical material world for spiritual gnosis um they call it being a space monkey i, I like it you know and again this this ties into masonry you know you get the gnosis you get the spiritual enlightenment by joining the secret society um fight club which is all male just like Freemasonry, um, in order to join, you know, they got the, 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 the sacred temple there on Paper Street, um, with the, the sort of the, the dojo. Um, you, you have to stand outside for three days in order to gain entrance. And again, three days, 
you think of the first three degrees of Freemasonry. So yeah, I mean a lot of a lot of Gnostic um, thought. I mean I I've, I talk about Gnostic cinema in in both my books, um, but just right off the top of my head, I mean yeah, the the, the Matrix movie. Um, is overloaded with Gnostic themes. The Truman Show is very Gnostic. Fight Club is a very Gnostic movie. Um, I get into this. If you're interested in Gnostic cinema, definitely check out Cinema Symbolism and Cinema Symbolism 2. I get into this um, much, much more um, in, in both my books um, on, on movies. Um, not, Gnosticism is a, very, is a very popular theme in cinema. And it's funny because those are like my favorite movies, The Matrix, The Truman Show, Fight Club, but those are movies that influenced my life so much, and I wonder how many other people out there have been influenced to that to such a high degree by these movies that are just jam packed with these symbolic spiritual concepts. Oh no, no doubt about it, Daniel. I mean, Fight Club is probably one of my all time favorite movies as well. That's probably in my top three movies of all time. I mean, and, and the breakdown on these movies, I mean, they they really just do a great job. On, on all these Gnostic themes. I mean, I like, you know, you have, you have in, um, you know, you have in, 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 in the matrix. I mean, you have, you know, the Hermes Trismegistus figure, the wisdom provider who is Morpheus. I mean, you know, you just look at the scene, you know, I mean, you have, you have the whole idea in that also of the unification with Neo, the masculine with the, you know, it's the unification of the sun and moon, him being the masculine. I mean, I mean, you have the whole idea of, you know, again, the death and resurrection of Neo, you know, who's killed and resurrected, then he can, def- you know, then he can defeat the Archons, um, and then he sees the phony world. You know, you have the whole idea with the sacred feminine, with Trinity, you know, what a great name to give to her. This ties into, um, this ties into Gnostic teachings coming out of the, out of the Nag Hammadi library, um, where, you know, they taught that uh, Sophia, the sacred feminine, was part of the divine trim- trinity. You'll find this in, like, the Gospel of Truth and other Gnostic texts. Um, so, I mean, that's a great name to give to give to her Trinity, you know, the sacred feminine. I mean, so you have the unification of the male and female. I mean, I like it. I mean, just right off the bat, I mean, you have the whole idea of, you know, Neo or Anderson going into the sacred temple to meet Hermes, which is Morpheus. I mean, he goes up the staircase, the ladder of ascension to receive wisdom. I mean, they've got the black and white checkerboard there reflecting the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebsuit um, in, in the Bible. I mean, again, this is the threshing floor. This is the floor of Solomon's temple. This ties into Freemasonry, you know, going into the sacred temple to, to receive wisdom, to receive Gnosis. Morpheus being the Hermes Trismegistus just as wisdom provider who's going to tell him, you know, what's going on. I mean, you have the whole idea with the red and blue pill. The blue pill puts you to sleep. I mean, this ties into a lot of other movies. Um, you go back in time the movies like Saturn 3 where they took a blue pill to go to sleep you'd go to a movie that came out um, uh, a few years earlier called The Fifth Element where the stewardesses when the people are traveling to Flossed in Paradise the, the stewardesses were all dressed in the light blue put the passengers to sleep the red pill um, wakes you up and gives you the real world I like this whole dichotomy with the red and blue in Freemasonry you have the blue lodge versus the high degrees which are called the red degrees so it's like further wisdom I mean, that is really a great interplay. And then I like it, you know, when 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 Neo wakes up, he literally goes through the looking glass again, you know, morphs with the mirror. This is a tie into Alice in Wonderland. And again, Alice in Wonderland has has Gnostic themes as well, where she goes on this magical adventure to receive wisdom. I mean, there's a ton going on in these movies and and, and it's just, you know, overloaded with with symbolism, very Gnostic, very occult. Um, And yeah, I mean, I agree with you, Daniel, Um, you know. Fight Club, make the first Matrix movie, The Truman Show. Again, great films. I, I really like them. I really like dissecting them and decoding them. And again, if you're interested in this, um, by all means, check out Cinema Symbolism and Cinema Symbolism 2. Um, I get into this much more in depth in those books. Would you say that being that this belief system of Gnosticism is so prevalent, it seems to be making a comeback or really exploding in cinema in recent years. Uh, How do you feel about the idea that we truly are in some kind of matrix that might be uh, a materialistic thing? Do you believe that to be true? Are we in a matrix? Well, that's sort of what Gnosticism teaches. I don't know if we're in a matrix. I can't, I can't answer that. I don't know if I fully believe that, but I definitely think there are evils associated with materialism. Um, and I believe that, um, you know, you know, the whole idea is, you know, when you, sh- I mean, I, 
you know, I, I do believe that material that materialism can lead to evil um, and can lead to bad things. Um, certainly, you know, you know, there, you know, we, you know, some of it can be taken out of context. I mean, some materialism is certainly okay, whether or not we are in a totally false reality created by the demiurge, which is sort of the, you know, the, the fashioner of this world, and there's a higher true spiritual god. That is a very main. I mean, that is Gnosticism 101. I don't know if it's something I believe in. A lot of Gnostics do. Um, but, you know, Gnosticism, I mean, the whole idea of gaining Gnosis and wisdom. Um, yeah, I mean, you'll find it modern day, but you'll find it going back um, in time. I mean, you, you know, you will find Gnostic thought. You'll find it in the Bible. I mean, um, you know, certainly, uh, you know, you, you know, you can Gnostically interpretate the Bible. Um, you will find a Gnostic revival in the, in the Renaissance. Um, you know, the, you know, you, you, you'll find a twining of this with Neoplatonic thought, which is sort of the twining of paganism with Christianity. Um, you will find parallels with that, although they are a little different. That's true as well. But, um, you know, I mean, even in the works of people like Herman Melville um, and and Ralph Waldo Emerson, you will find a Gnostic rebellion sort of against the material world going on. So you, you will find this, um, you know, throughout the ages. It's not necessarily a completely new thing. But I do agree with you, Daniel. You will um, definitely find Gnosticism. It seems to be a very popular theme in films, whether it be The Matrix or The Truman Show. I mean, I'm just naming sort of the big three. Um, but you will find, um, you know, I get into cinema symbolism, too. One of my other favorite movies is, I, I don't know if you've ever seen it, it's a movie called The Warriors. Um, uh, that, that actually hints at Gnosticism. Um, oh, really? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's one of my all-time favorites. I wouldn't necessarily go so far as to call The Warriors necessarily a Gnostic movie, but it definitely flirts with it. I mean, I, I like the whole idea, you know, in that where, you know, you certainly have the, the nighttime journey of these guys and, and, and sort of the, 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 um, you know, you know, they're sort of on a quest to find themselves. Um, the, the gang, the warriors where, where, they're, where they go to meet with, you know, where they go to, they go to the rally to, to, to meet with, uh, you know, the other gangs. And of course, Cyrus is there. Interesting name to give him, by the way. Um, Cyrus, the gang leader, this represents, uh, reflects a, 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 a Persian monarch named Cyrus the Great who was trying to unify Persia. So, of course, Cyrus is trying to unify all the gangs under under one banner. Uh, this is exactly what the Persian monarch Cyrus the Great did. But then the warriors, you know, go on this nighttime journey, um, and, and they battle all these other gangs who are sort of a reflection of themselves almost. And, of course, they're masculine. You know, they're the warriors. They're warlike. And, of course, they encounter their sacred feminine. Um, and she's the exact opposite of them. I mean, mercy is her name. I mean, and, and that's just it, merciful, to be benevolent. So you have this dualistic play off of that. And I like it. They finally get back to Coney Island and the sun's rising, bringing light. And, and they sort of have this epiphany and they see they, they're overlooking the dilapidated Coney Island. And they say, you know, is this what we fall on night like to get back to this sort of materialistic hellhole? Um, and they sort of do undergo this spiritual enlightenment where at the end, when the sun's rising, they walk away from it. They give it up. Um, and I thought I thought that was a very sort of Gnostic interplay there. I, I don't know if I go so far as to say it's Gnostic like the fight, you know, like Fight Club or The Matrix, but it definitely hints at Gnostic themes. It's one of my all time favorite movies. I, I get into it more in cinema symbolism, too. But, um, yeah, I mean, there, there definitely seems to be a Gnostic revival underway. And um, again, you, you know, you, you will find this in in movies. No question about it. Yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you. The Warriors. It, what you said struck a chord with me because that's one of my all-time favorite movies. I mean, who doesn't love the uh, the baseball furies, the guys that were dressed like baseball players? Of course, <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah. And, and the uh, yeah, I mean, you have all the the, the strange gangs, you know, uh, you know, the Turnbull ACs and uh, the the yeah, the the baseball furies, the Lizzies. Um, oh, it's a great, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a great movie. Um, and, uh, like I said, I don't know if I go so far as to call it a Gnostic film, but it definitely hints, let's leave it at that. It hints and flirts with Gnostic themes. I'm much more happier saying than that than calling it a Gnostic movie. Like I would something like the Truman show or fight club or the matrix. Now in the world of cinema, there's obviously so much, symbolism there but are there any particular movie makers that are just total repeat offenders in terms of packing their movies with tons of symbiology yeah um absolutely um hang on 
Yeah, I mean, um, well, like the Wachowskis. I mean, all three of the first. I mean, like you, you mean like like where you see it like in the same movie, like the same movie maker over and over again. Yeah, I mean, I mean, some movie makers, um, you know, shy away from it. They use it in some movies. They use it in, in, in you know, they use symbolism in other movies um, to convey other meanings. I mean, like for example, I mean, like you know, the back. I mean, the Back to the Future movies is something I really dissect in the first. Um, movie book um, that is a comparative religion study that Zemeckis does. Um, I, I don't buy into predictive programming per se. Um, I, I can say, I mean, I do believe that movies can be prophetic. Um, I have a different explanation than necessarily predictive programming. But the entire Back to the Future um, movie is, you know, the trilogy is a comparative study with the Egyptian solar religion. Um, but Zemeckis likes to place presidents in his movies. Doc Brown is a metaphoric stand-in for Ronald Reagan. Um, you will find this with Zemeckis with other films, with Forrest Gump, for instance, who is Bill Clinton. Um, uh, Whip Whitaker in Flight is Barack Obama. I'm not sure why he seems to be fascinated by this. Um, Stanley Kubrick in The Shining has loads of symbolism that that repeats um, and, and, and repetitive symbolism with numbers and, and different symbols. Um, he does this ad nauseum in The Shining to bombard your subconscious mind um, with, with repetition to convey this endless reincarnation cycle going on inside the Overlook. Um, but then he doesn't use it in movies such as, you know, like Full Metal Jacket, you know, or even things like Barry Lyndon. Um, he, he doesn't he doesn't really use any any hardcore symbolism in those movies. But then again, you know, you, you fast forward to his final movie, um, Eyes Wide Shut, which again does have a lot of symbolism in it. But he doesn't use the same symbolism that he used in The Shining. He uses different symbolism. And I like that. Um, and, um, you know, I think that's really what, what that to me is. Uh, really the, 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 the marksman, the, the mark of a real craftsman, um, who, someone who can use this symbolism. But this, this is key to what I talk about in my books, Daniel. It's the context of what it's, pre of what it's presented in. So, you know, you know, these guys who are really masters at it, they know when to present the right symbols, you know, and then this is key to interpreting this and, and really is the, the, the critical, you know, starting point for me is determining the context of the movie. You know, is it an alchemical movie? Is it a Gnostic film? Am I dealing with archetypes? What type of archetypes? You know, if so, can I look for numerology? Can I look for, you know, you know, what, what type of symbols am I looking for? So, yeah, I mean, you, you definitely have masters at it. Um, but the real masters at it, like like the Stanley Kubrick, alternate the symbolism to fit the context of the movie. I guess that's really what I'm trying to say. But, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, you know, Zemeckis is very good with it. Um, Kubrick, by certainly, I mean, my goodness gracious, you turn to a movie like Black Swan by Darren Aronofsky. I mean, that is masterful, the symbolism going on that. I mean, I, I could do a whole show on Black Swan in and of itself. Um, in fact, in fact, the study of Black Swan is so overwhelming, I had to split it in half and put it in two books. I have half of it in the first cinema book and the second half in the second cinema book. Um, it was so overwhelming. So, yeah, I mean, these guys are very expert at it. But like I said, the mark of the real craftsman is when they, they, they present the material in its proper context. Um, and, and that's when, you know, you, you, you really can start decoding this on a symbolic level by discovering that context. Okay. And it is so good talking to you, Robert. I want to take a short break just so we can freshen up a bit. I need to go use the bathroom. So why don't we break for 10 minutes and then we'll come back and get into a little bit more about the movies. Sounds good. All right. See you in a bit. Talk to you in a bit. Mm -hmm. And welcome back to End of Days Radio. I hope you enjoyed our break. I will be seeing if Robert is ready to go. Just typing him a little message. Yep, looks like he's good to go. Robert, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. I do want to... I... Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. So I was back. Thank you again for having me on End of Days. My pleasure. Awesome. I do want to ask you a little bit about another movie. I would say it's a favorite of mine, but I'm not really sure it's a favorite. It's more just like a childhood memento, and I'm sure most people out there would agree. I'm talking about The Wizard of Oz. Does this movie slash book, does it contain a lot of symbolism? 
Oh my goodness gracious, yes. Um, my goodness, yeah. I mean, this is uh, this is uh, overloaded with all sorts of imagery. Um, this is one of those ones. Um, where do you begin with? I talk about the Wizard of Oz in my first in my first movie book, Cinema Symbolism. I have a whole chapter on the Wizard of Oz. Um, the man who wrote it um, was L. Frank Baum, who was in Madame Blavatsky's uh, the Theosophy Society. Um, which was essentially neo Gnosticism. Just returning to the topic we were talking about, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, Wizard of Oz is multi layered. Um, you have, you know, on its face, the the idea, you know, just just the story that it's, you know, an adventure of this, you know, farm girl who goes on this mystical journey. She has an adventure, then goes home at the end. End of story. Have a nice day. Um, but then you have also these two encoded, deeper levels of symbolism. Um, one is more known than the other one. One is a political allegory. Um, the Wizard of Oz is a mirror, as a mirror image of late 19th century, early 20th century America, where I, w I won't belabor this a whole lot. I mean, again, this is another topic I could speak all night on. Um, where you have the Wizard of Oz is a, is a reference is is the president at the time William McKinley, um, that you know he lives in you know McKinley wanted to use gold the gold standard to back paperback money. This is why the Wizard is in the Emerald City. This is why the Yellow Brick lo ro Road always leads to Emerald City. It's the gold standard leading to um, to to the creation of paper money in the um, in the in the book. Her slippers are silver. Um, not Ruby. They, they changed it in the movie because the silver slippers didn't come up right on the screen. They didn't look right. Um, and in, in the movie, in, in the, in the book, it's silver slippers, which is a reference to something called the free silver movement, which was similar to the, to the gold standard. This is why you have the whole idea of gold and silver always leading to paper money. Um, and then you've got parallels with the, um, the, the scarecrow being American, the American farmer. Um, you have the whole idea of Tin Man being a, a representation of, a, of the American laborer. In 1896, there was a depression, a recession that laid off many laborers. Um, and, and this is why Tin Man is immobile. He can't move. He's unemployed. And, and the, the laborer was put back to work by the oil companies, Standard Oil, J.P. Rockefeller, excuse me, of J.P. Morgan and uh, Nelson Rockefeller. And of course, this is why the Tin Man needs oil to get moving again. Um, so you have the whole idea of this of this story being a political allegory mirroring 1890s, uh, you know, 1890s America, you know, even, you know, right up until, you know, 1900, I'd say. Um, but then you have a deeper um, interpretation of it and sort of this is where you get into Baum being involved with uh, Blavatsky's uh, mystery school, um, this sort of initiation into the mystery tradition um idea of sort of dorothy going it, it's, a, it's again it's a gnostic journey she goes on this journey of self-discovery which for her is that there's no place like home uh that that's her gnostic epiphany and you have the whole idea of her you know starting out and she goes up the ladder of ascension to receive wisdom um up the tornado to the magical land this is paralleled in alice in wonderland where alice goes down the rabbit hole or jack and the beanstalk where jack goes up the beanstalk to the magical realm um, and of course she gets up there and then you have the two competing. I, I like the whole idea of the two competing witches. You have the one witch, the white witch who has the pentagram on her wand, which is one point up and two point down. That's white magic. That's white capitalism. When the two points are up and one point is down, that's black magic. And then you have, um, you know, the, the evil sister, the evil witches. Um, and, and this, this is really interesting. This is a really interesting play that Baum does. The, the positive witches um, are of the north and south, symbolizing just that, the ladder of ascension, moving upwards and downwards. You don't receive motion, you know, gnosis. You receive gnosis going up the ladder of ascension, um, going up, you know, the ladder of Minerva, you know, Jacob's ladder, if you want to call it that, out of the Bible. And then, of course, the two evil witches are of the east and west. You don't receive gnosis um, by moving sideways. So, you know, they're static. Um, they're, they're stasis. They're trying to harm Dorothy and keep her in a state of sort of spiritual darkness. That's why they're of the east and west. But, of course, the, the good witches are the north and south, trying to move her up and down the ladder, symbolically up and down the ladder of ascension. And then you have the whole idea in this. And again, this is sort of Blavatsky's theosophy. This is neo-Gnosticism, where, you know, you're on the, the path of enlightenment. Um, the golden brick, you know, the yellow brick road, the path of Gnosis, 
you know, and again, you know, this is sort of mirroring the Abrahamic faiths where you're on this sort of golden path of religion, which leads, leads to the false messiah. You know, the demiurge, the wizard who is this materialistic fraud. He's an illusion. He, he's a sham. Um, and you know, you know, that, that's an interesting parallel. You know, you know, th- th- he's this dark evil figure, but he's really not. He's just, it's, it's, a, it's an illusion. This ties into Gnostic thought with, you know, again, what we were talking about earlier with, with the matrix, you know, and, and it being a, a, an illusionary world, world. And, you know, the wizard is just this harmless little guy be- behind the curtain, as it were. So you will have, um, these 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 very deep Gnostic themes and you know I call it in the book sort of initiation into the mysteries where you know you'll find this also in, in Alice in Wonderland where the girl goes on this mystical adventure um, to, to discover herself to have this Gnostic epiphany um, you know which which for for, uh, for for Dorothy Gale is there's no place like home um, in Alice in Wonderland it's it's the same sort of uh, parallel where she goes on this mad- magical world to discover the world of adults is not what it's cracked up to be and that it's okay to be yourself um, and and you know it, it's it's parallel this in, 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 in Alice in Wonderland you will find this exact same theme I talk about this in the book with another movie that came out about five or six years ago called The Lovely Bones. Um, and this is where the girl actually dies and has to navigate the magical realm to have this sort of, uh, you know, again, a, a epiphany of learning to abandon the material world for the spiritual realm. Um, you'll find it paralleled in that in that movie as well. So, yeah, I mean, Wizard of Oz is one of my all time favorites. It's an American classic. Everybody knows it. And uh, I mean, I put it actually I actually put the image on the cover of the first cinema book. So if you're interested in The Wizard of Oz and its deep occult symbolism by by far and away, definitely, uh, Daniel, take a look at my first cinema book. Uh, I get into uh, Wizard of Oz uh, much, much more in depth than I'm talking about it right now. Now, I saw a movie. You may have seen this. You may not have. It came out maybe four, three or four years ago. It's called Snowpiercer. Have you seen that? You know, I have not seen Snowpiercer, but it is. I've I've been told that movie. I've been told by. It's funny you bring that one up. It's on my um, to see list um, for for my next book. I have been told by numerous people that this movie is very gnostic. Um, I have not seen it, um, but it is on my to see list. And but but you're not the first person to mention this movie to me. I haven't seen it, so I can't really comment on the symbolism. Suffice to say, I, I have talked to other people about it, or people have told me about it, I should say, and have told me that they believe this movie contains very deep Gnostic themes. Absolutely. You you are going to really like this one. Yeah, I haven't seen it. Um, I have not seen Snowpiercer. I have heard about it. Um, and I, I really wanted, I really wanted to venture into an analysis of a movie I haven't seen, but I have been told by, um, many people, many fr- friends of mine who are very much into Gnosticism that Snowpiercer is an incredibly deep Gnostic film. So I can, I can report though that it's on my two C list and, uh, you know, who knows, uh, maybe, uh, it'll go in cinema symbolism three. Uh, we'll have to see. Awesome. Uh, is there anything else that is on your two watch list? Yeah, absolutely. Um, sure. Um, it's, uh, you know, some, so I, you know, there are some movies that people have, you know, said, oh, you got to see, you got to see, you got to see. Um, the, the, you know, the ones that keep coming up are the ones that, you know, I, I can't tell you that I'm going to analyze it because I haven't seen it, you know, and until I see it and if, if there's something worthy of analysis, I'll, I'll get into it or dissecting. Uh, movies that I have not seen that are on my to see list are Interstellar. Um, that is one that I am repeatedly asked to take a look at. Um, Prometheus is one I've actually not gotten around to seeing yet. Um, as crazy as that, as that may sound, I, 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 I want to see that. Um, the one that everyone keeps telling me about, and, and this comes up over and over again, um, with, with shows and with hosts and, and I get emails about this movie all the time. It's amazing. I have not seen it is the Lego movie. Um, the very first Lego movie uh, from around eight or nine years ago, not the Batman one that came out a year a year ago, but the very first Lego movie. I, I, have, I have been told by numerous people that this is overloaded with Gnostic and occult imagery, um, and I haven't seen it. And, and that is absolutely at the top of my uh, to see list. So and certainly, I mean, just just from a modern standpoint, I saw uh, I, I saw episode seven, of course. Uh, the last Star Wars movie. I liked it. There was a lot going on in that movie. 
I've yet to see Rogue One. Uh, I've seen pieces of it. I generally know what it's about, of course, but um, that's on my probably the top of my to see list. Um, so yeah, I mean, Snowpiercer's up there. Those are up there. Um, and the Lego movie. Um, I, I get, I get emailed about the Lego movie is the one I get asked about the most, believe it or not. Um, apparently there, there is all kind of esoteric imagery in this thing. Um, and I'm looking forward to checking it out. Yeah, that's news to me. I, I wouldn't think that there would be any spirituality inside the <laughs> Lego movie. <laughs> You know, you know, it's funny. That's sort of that was sort of my impression of it. But I've been emailed by numerous people and people who I know they know what they're talking about. Um, and and the Lego, believe it or not, I would I would say to you, out of all the movies I've been asked to take a look at, the Lego Movie is the top of the list. I, I get emailed about that one all the time, or tw- tweeted about, you know, have you seen the Lego Movie yet? Check out the Lego Movie. Um, apparently, this is very Freemasonic and Gnostic. I have yet to see it. It's it's right there at the top of my to see list. Um, and uh, I, you know, once I take a look at it, and if I, you know, if I think there's something worthy of dissecting, uh, we'll do it for Cinema Symbolism three when I get around to it. You said that you didn't see Prometheus, but are you pretty familiar with the Aliens movies? Yes, yes, I am. I have not seen Prometheus, but I do get into, um, you know, I do get into some of the symbolism of the Alien movies. Um, you know, and again, it's, it's with those, um, I like the alien movies. Um, but you know, I, I like it for a couple of reasons. It's one is it's really the exaltation of the sacred feminine. I mean, you, you really have the lunar slash solar heroine, you know, with Ellen Ripley there doing battle with the dark evil creatures. I, I like that. Um, I like, um, you know, and again, she, you know, she, she, she is very much like, you know, a lot of these, um, you know, solar, you know, these he- hero types, um, you know, and again, you, you know, when, when you, when you're dealing with this, you're always dealing with the Christ story, you know, whether it's Neo Anderson who gets killed and resurrected, even Ellen Ripley gets killed and resurrected. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I like the alien movies. Um, it's, it's very, you know, Manichaean light versus darkness. Um, and, and they're good films anyway. Um, some of the more, the more recent ones I haven't seen, I haven't seen alien covenant yet. I've seen obviously the first one, the second one. Uh, I, I think what the third one was Alien 3 and then it was Alien Resurrection. I think, you know, that, that's where it kind of, I kind of tuned out after that. And then the Alien versus Predator stuff. It's been years since I've seen that stuff. But, um, you know, the, the first, the first three and then the, even the Resurrection one, the Resurrection one was a little creepy. Um, but they're great films. I mean, they're, they're not bad. Uh, I guess Alien, Aliens, I guess the second one is probably my favorite. That, that one I thought was really good. Um, but you know, they're great films. Are there any foreign movies that you really enjoy? Um, yes. Um, I'd have to think for a minute. I'm trying to think of, uh, well, it depends on what, what you're categorizing as a foreign film. Um, you know, certainly, certainly like, you know, a movie that was made by a foreign director, director overseas and was distributed here in America through an American company. Um, you know, certainly like the spaghetti westerns of Sergio Leone. I mean, my goodness gracious, I talk about these in Cinema Symbolism, too. Um, the, the, these movies are, oh, I, I almost call those movies uh, cinematic Christian Kabbalah. I mean, th- those movies are overloaded with deep religious Catholic symbolism, um, you know, and Christian mysticism, the, the, the spaghetti westerns of Leone. Um, you, you will find this, although, he's, you know, although it's not a foreign film, um, you know, you will find these, these themes paralleled in the Gangs of New York movie with uh, Scorsese. Um, but no, I, I, I like, uh, I have no problem with, uh, foreign cinema or foreign directors. Um, you know, the, 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 the spaghetti westerns were filmed in Italy. That's why they're called spaghetti westerns and made by a foreign film producer. Naturally, they was distributed here in the States with a, with an American company. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I have no problem with, uh, overseas films. And, uh, you know, again, Daniel, it's just a matter of analysis. Some movies have esoteric symbolism. Some don't. Um, you know, you know, we look for it, I look for it, but I don't insert it. I don't just make it up. I only, you know, analyze it if I think it's worthy of analyzing. But, um, certainly the, um, the spaghetti westerns of Leone are overloaded with Christian mysticism. No question about it. How about Stephen King? Is there any symbolism in there? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, again, it's, it's, you, you get into the novels, probably less in the novels. I mean, but, you know, you get into, um, you know, it's funny you mentioned King to me because you get into something like The Shining. 
um, where where Kubrick just went AWOL and, you know, just went absolutely bananas, inserting all this esoteric imagery and, and repetitive devices in, in The Shining um, that are, that is not in King's novel. Um, King's novel is more of a ghost story um, more than anything else. Um, and, you know, Kubrick turned this whole whole thing into this movie about reincarnation and, you know, um, you know, re- re- repetition in the Overlook, that there was this vicious re-cycle cycle going on inside the Overlook that you couldn't turn off, that was just endlessly repeating over and over again. And Kubrick just went absolutely insane with, I mean, that's not the right word, but he really embedded in The Shining just all these dualistic, double repeating symbols um, all over the place. I mean, and, you know, I, I don't know if you're aware of this or not. King, King Stephen King did not like Kubrick's um, Kubrick's movie. Um, he didn't like it at all. Um, and and um, this is a true story. When when um, you know The Shining came out, I liked it. I love Kubrick's uh, movie. I think it's tremendous. Um, and I really like the symbolism he uses. I mean, that is really a deep study there when it comes to repeating symbols and repetitive devices. I mean, I, I can get into it with a little bit, you know, a little bit with you if you want. We'll do it. Let me just wrap up with um, you know w- w- with this point that King did not like um, uh, Kubrick's vision of The Shining, so much so that he actually purchased the rights back from Warner Brothers. And you may remember this, I certainly do, in the mid-1990s, I think it, started, I think it was 1996, I want to say, there was actually a, a made-for-TV version of The Shining, which was what King wanted. This was the more accurate retelling of the story he thought this was actually produced by Stephen King. It starred, um, I, I can't remember who played Jack Torrance. Uh, Rebecca De Mornay was the wife, but um, this was more in keeping with what King wanted. Um, and again, this came out in the mid 1990s. King King had purchased the rights. So, yeah, I mean, you know, with with King, you, you get some art, you know, in, in his stories, just in general, you get some archetypical imagery. But I mean, with The Shining, with what Kubrick did, you know, with with all this repeating um, symbolism, um, it's really uncanny, Daniel, the lengths that um, that Kubrick went to to embed this repetitive symbolism in The Shining. And I mean, you know, I've even said it on other shows. He went so far that you could almost argue that King forgot to tell the story of The Shining. And this may have been what upset King. But, um, you know, you know, the study of The Shining, I talk about it in cinema symbolism. I have a whole section of the sh- on the section. Uh, excuse me. I have a whole section on The Shining in cinema symbolism, too. If you like, I can get into this briefly if you want. I mean, it's your show. I don't want to, you know, if you've got other questions, that's fine. But um, there is all kind of repetitive devices going on inside Kubrick's The Shining. Yeah, you, can, you feel free to go right into it. Yeah, let me just get a swig of uh, ginger ale here. Hang on, because this is a bit of a mind bender. Hang on one sec. Yeah, no problem. I'm kind of a ginger ale guy myself. I like the Canada Dry. Uh, that's why I got a bottle of it right in front of me. I have a bottle of Can- Canadian Canada Dry ginger ale right in front of me. So, right, The Shining, Um, repetition. We are dealing with endless reincarnation inside The Shining. Um, We have um, the the room number 237 was changed um, by by Kubrick. It's, I think, 213 in the novel. Um, Why did he change it? Well, we we have repetition. If if you multiply 2 times 3 times 7, you get the number 42. Uh, The number 42 repeats. you have uh, the Danny wearing the number 42 on his uh, on his shirt at the beginning when he's talking in the mirror um, to the imaginary friend. Um, Scatman Crothers, Halloran, when he's driving back um, to the Overlook, has the number 42 on his uh, license plate. Um, when Danny and Wendy are watching the movie in, in the Overlook Hotel, the um, the number is uh, the, the movie they're watching is the summer of 42. The number 42 repeats uh, the phrase all work and no play makes Jack a doll boy uh, consists of uh, 33 letters with uh, nine spaces at thir- not 33 plus nine to get the number 32 uh, 42. Excuse me. So we have repetition with the number 42. We have no repetition with the number 12. Um, and this is uh, the number 12 ties into the Zodiac. 
Um, that's another story. We won't have time to get into that because you have a, an entire solar allegory going on with Jack Torrance um, and a, an alchemical storyline as well. Jack Torrance is always hanging out in the golden solar room. Uh, he drives the yellow Volkswagen. The road he's driving on is called the going to the sun road at the beginning. So we have an alchemical solar allegory going on with this as well. But we have the number 12 that that Kubrick utterly bombards your subconscious mind with. Um, you add two plus three uh, plus seven, room two, three, seven again to get the number 12. You have the characters of Charles Grady and Delbert Grady. Um, both their names contain 12 letters. Um, while, uh, you know, you have the name of the hotel. The code name is KDK12. Um, you have uh, when, when they um, er, when Danny and Wendy are in the hedge maze, they take 12 turns. Um, you have Jack uh, hitting the door with the axe 12 times. He throws the ball against the wall 12 uh, times as well. Um, you have, uh, what's his name? Halloran. When he's explaining all the foods in, in the storeroom, you have, uh, you know, 24 po pork roast, which is 12 times two, 24 pound bags of sugar. Um, you know, the number 12 repeats over and over again. Um, and it's, you know, the, the, there are two times shown on the screen, 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. at 8 plus 4 to get the number 12. So you have Kubrick just bombarding your head with these repetitive num numbers, these repetitive devices. And then it begs the question, OK, why, why is he doing that? You know, why has he chosen to, to do this? And the answer is because he is bombarding your subconscious mind with re repetition to convey this endless reincarnation cycle going on inside the overlook. It's a fascinating study. I'm just tipping the iceberg with it right now. If you're interested in The Shining, by all means, check out Cinema Symbolism. And by all means, check out Cinema Symbolism, too. I get into that much more in depth in um, in that book. I have a whole breakdown on The Shining. It, it, it's a very deep movie. It has an alchemical storyline. It has um, loads of symbolism in it um, with repetition and doubles and and just over, overwhelming symbolism in The Shining. It's a great study. Um, by all means, check out Cinema Symbolism, too, if you're interested. Okay, and we are starting to wind down a little bit, so I wanted to get back to the occult world just a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sure, I, no yeah I know you're working on the new book, and I, I just wanted to ask, how does Babylon fit into Freemasonry? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. No problem. Um, what we are dealing with here is the high degrees of Freemasonry. So, yeah, I mean, how does this 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 tie into Babylon? Um, it has to do, Daniel, with the construction of the second temple um, when when when. You have the construction of the first temple, which is Solomon's temple. This is what the, the degrees of the first degrees of masonry sort of center around, especially the third degree. The third degree ritual of the Blue Lodge revolves around the construction of the first temple of Solomon's temple. This is the first temple of God. This is the temple that in Masonic ritual here in Mabif is building when he's murdered by three ruffians and ultimately brought back to life. He's killed and resurrected. Um, when you get into the high degrees, you have the collapse of the um, Sol of Solomon's Temple. It's destroyed by the Persians, and the Hebrews go into exile in Persia, in Babylon. Um, and it's not until uh, a, a Persian monarch, this is someone who we mentioned earlier, um, named Cyrus the Great, who was trying to unify the Persian Empire under one banner, he, he dispatches a Jewish governor. He liberates the Hebrews to an extent, a, a Jewish governor named Zorobabel. Um, whose name literally means, depending on how you want to translate it, the heart of Babylon or the path to Babylon or the road to Babylon. Cyrus dispatches um, uh, him back to the Holy Land, back to the Temple Mount to start building the second temple of God, which is called the te which is called that the second temple or the Temple of Zorobabel. So, when, you know, th th this is what is being documented in the high degrees of Freemasonry and especially this royal art ceremonial where the second temple, this, this Babylonian, you know, quote unquote temple named after, you know, you know, the heart of Babylon is being temp is being built on the on the Temple Mount, um, you know, the Temple of Zorobabel. And it's this it's this high degree ritual where this is what I talk about in, in my first book, The Royal Arch of Enoch. It is it is in this ritual where the um, this this uh, hidden treasure vault 
this subterranean treasure vault is discovered where um, this Masonic treasure is is located. Um, and, and this is really sort of the uh, premier degree in the high degrees of Freemasonry. So there is this whole Babylonian incursion um, into into the high degrees of Freemasonry surrounding the Second Temple of Zorobabel. Um, and it's... Uh, it's it's something I talk about in the Royal Arch of Enoch, and I'm, I'm working on, like you mentioned, I'm working on another book called The Path to Babylon. That's its working title anyway, where I'm going to get more into this sort of Babylonian comparative influence with Freemasonry. That's sort of the uh, thesis or crux of the book right now, as it were. Do you do you happen to know anything about the Rosicrucians? I sure do. What do you want to know? Uh, what is their whole thing? Why, how are they different than the Freemasons? Well, right, again, this is, you're, you're into, you're into a little speculation here because we don't really know. Um, Rosicrucianism really should be thought of more of a, as a philosophical doctrine than necessarily as a secret group. I mean, we have people in history who you can document as Rosicrucians. Um, Johann Valentin Andreas, um, he, he was a Rosicrucian. He, he, he is, is responsible for a Rosicrucian treaties, uh, known as the alchemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz. Rosicrucianism was allegedly founded by this guy named Christian Rosenkreutz, who, like all these other guys, probably didn't exist. Um, it's a, it's a mystical alchemical doctrine that populated Europe in, in the 15 and 1600s. Um, if you read the book by Francis Yates called the Rosicrucian Enlightenment, she calls it a failed enlightenment, but that spawned sort of the real enlightenment. Um, you, you will find elements of Rosicrucianism and alchemy, certainly in Freemasonry and the high degrees. I mean, even in the Scottish Rite, you have, um, you know, a, a degree, you know, the Rose Croix. Uh, chapter, which is a reference to the Rosicrucians. It's a mystical alchemical group. Um, you know, it was sort of, you know, again, one of these groups sort of like Gnostics, you know, and, you know, the study of Kabbalah that taught, you know, self-improvement through the study of the occult and the mysteries. And, you know, it, it ties into a lot of alchemical themes as well. So, yeah, I mean, the Rosicrucians are important. You will find Rosicrucian doctrines in modern day Freemasonry. No question about it. I think that's pretty safe to say. Um I would view, I, I think you're, you're more accurate to view Rosicrucianism as a mystical doctrine, um, more than as an actual group. But again, you can pin down people in history who were Rosicrucians. The two biggies that come to mind was this guy I mentioned, Andreas, who wrote this, uh, treaties. There, there are three Rosicrucian treaties, um, the Fama, the Confessio, and the Alchemical Wedding of Christian Rosencruz. The last one was written by this guy named Andrea. The first two, the Fama and the Confessio, were most likely written by a, a Elizabethan magus known as Dr. John D. He is most likely the guy responsible for those two. So, um, yeah, I mean, Rosicrucian is important. You will find Rosicrucian trappings in modern free, modern day Freemasonry. Um, pretty irrefutable, I would think. It's an interesting study. Um, and, uh, you know, like I said, if you're interested in Rosicrucianism, but, you know, check out the Royal Arch of Enoch book. I, I talk about it in that. Okay, awesome. And we are approaching the bottom of the hour. So I wanted to go ahead and just open up the floor and give you an opportunity to go ahead and say whatever you'd like to say. If you want to get on the soapbox a little bit, that's fine. Or if you just want to go right ahead and start plugging your stuff, feel free to do whatever you want right now. Yeah, well, for starters, Daniel, thank you for um, having me on End of Days. I, I really appreciate it. I thought it was a great show. Um, I really appreciate your invite. Um, you know, anytime you want to do this, just let me know. Um, again, I thought that the show was tremendous. I certainly could stick around for a little bit if some people have some questions from the chat room. Um, but thank you so much for having me on End of Days. I, I thought the show was terrific. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, if, if, if you're interested in what I'm talking about and you're interested in my work and my research, the easiest way to find me is just go to my website. Um, my website is my name. My name is Robert W. Sullivan IV. My website is just that. It's www.robertwsullivaniv.com. Uh, the letter I, the letter V, the Roman numeral for the fourth. Robert W. Sullivan, IV.com. Um, there are links there to purchase my books. There are, there's a biography of me. If you want to learn more about me, there's an uh, events and appearance page where you can find out more radio shows and, uh, and, and appearances I'm going to be making. 
um, both on radio, podcasts. I have a media and press page where pre-recorded shows I'm placing. Um, I just had an interview that I recorded last week go live today, so you can check that out. Um, there are links to all my social media, Twitter, YouTube. I have a YouTube channel with videos, with playlists. Um, you can listen to other podcasts and radio shows and TV shows I've done. Um, that content is all 100% free. You can follow me on Twitter. Uh, there are Facebook fan pages uh, for my books, although these may be undergoing an overhaul in the next month or so. But, yeah, just go to my website. There's links there to buy the books. Royal Arch of Enoch has been republished as a second edition. Cinema Symbolism has been republished as a second edition. Cinema Symbolism 2 is out right now. Um, Royal Arch is out 100%. You can get the ebook. You can get the print edition. Same with Cinema Symbolism. Cinema Symbolism 2 is out right now, but only the print edition. Ebooks are still probably about two weeks away on that. Um, these are not, my books are available on all, all online, uh, major retailers, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million. You can get the ebooks on Apple iBookstore. Um, these are now on other sites such as like Interra, eBook Mall. Again, the easiest way to do this and the easiest way to find me is just go to my website. It's very easy to navigate. www. Robert W. Sullivan, Sullivan with two L's, the letter I, the letter V dot com. My name is Robert W. Sullivan, the fourth. So it's www. Robert W. Sullivan, IV dot com. Links to buy my books. Links for my social media, biography, events and appearances. It's a very easy page to navigate. Um, all you want right there. Like I said, all my books are available on all the online, all the major online retailers, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, ebooks, print editions are 100% available, except for the ebook of Cinema Symbolism 2, which will be out in about the next two weeks. So yeah, just go to my website. It's very easy to navigate. All the information is right there. Robert W. Sullivan, IV.com. Okay, awesome. It definitely, Robert, I thought this was a great discussion. And whenever I have you on, time just seems to slip out from underneath me. I was getting so into what we were talking about, I forgot to open up the phone line. So I do apologize for that. But I definitely like to get you on here again, uh, you know, whenever the timing is good for you. And we can get a little bit more into it. I, I do have a lot of questions left. So hopefully we could do a part three in the not too distant future. Yeah, absolutely, Daniel. Um, thank you for having me on. Certainly, I don't want to cannibalize your show. Um, you have my email. Um, absolutely. Shoot me an email. We can do this late summer. Um, anytime you're ready for me, um, you know, it's my pleasure to be here. I, I, I really enjoy doing your show. I think you're a tremendous host. I thought the questions were great. And uh, I really appreciate the uh, opportunity to discuss my research and my books with you. And um, like I said, I, I think your show is tremendous. And uh, I want to thank you personally for having me on. I really appreciate it. And uh, anytime you want to have me, I'm a willing guest. And I would love to come back on your show anytime. We can continue the discussion and uh, open it up to questions, for, you know, phone calls, chat room, Twitter, anything you want to do. It's fine with me. Uh, yeah. And one thing that uh, that my listeners slash fans like a lot about you is you are kind of the representative for us from the Freemasonic world. And you help us see past a lot of the miscon misconceptions and discrimination against Freemasons. So we really appreciate you for those reasons. Well, I appreciate you having me on, Daniel. I certainly, um, you know, I, I appreciate that opportunity. Certainly, I, I don't claim to speak for every Freemason out there. I wouldn't, I wouldn't claim that. I can only give you my perception, perspective on it. But um, no, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to try to dispel some of the myths. I know certainly that there's some bad information out there on, on Freemasonry. Um, I mean, there, there is, you know, some of it, there is a dark side to Freemasonry. Everything casts a shadow. Um, and I don't shy away from that. And uh, anything you want to ask me, I, I've always done my best to answer it. And again, I just really appreciate you having me on your show. Uh, I think it's tremendous. And again, again, anytime you want to have me on, you just shoot me an email and we'll book it. No problem. OK, awesome. In fact, why don't we just plan ahead a little bit and we'll do a little expose on your uh, next book right after it comes out? Yeah, I, I absolutely. I'm working on my first work of fiction now. And, um, you know, it's that's going to be a little while. Um, that's going to be a little while. So, you know, if you want to wait till that, that's certainly fine. Um, but if you ever wanted to have me back in the meantime, you know, to discuss any one of my books or preview that one, that's fine. I, I leave it completely up to you. It's your show. And anytime you want to have me on, it's not a problem.
Okay, awesome. I'll, I'll definitely give some, give that some thought. And until next time, you have a good night, my friend. Yeah, th- thank you, Daniel, for having me on. It was much appreciated. And uh, uh, thank you. And I look forward to the archive of the show. And I will definitely start spreading it around. Awesome. All right. Good night. And there you have it. That was Robert Sullivan the Fourth. So much to talk about with him. I absolutely love talking to that guy. Last time he was on, he just took the ball and ran with it, and I absolutely love that. I love guests that can really just go. Sorry, just shooting Robert a little message, uh, thanking him for coming on the show. I mean, what, what I really like about him in addition to the fact that he can just go, is he knows so much about so many different topics. He's well-versed in, I mean, look at all this stuff that we got into. Tarot cards, Gnosticism, Babylon, The Matrix, The Wizard of Oz. I mean, what more could you ask for? Oh, boy. And we'll definitely do it again. I mean, this show, I said at the beginning of this program, that this is a mission. I've always said that. I've always said that I believe that there's a mission here to wake people up. And I know that other shows out there have been sort of copying that whole thing. And it used to make me angry before, but nobody has a monopoly on enlightenment. Nobody has a monopoly on waking people up. I just want people people to wake up, period. And if anybody wants to copy me, imitation is the most sincere form of flattery. So go ahead. Don't just take my show and re-upload it to YouTube and try to make money off of it. Don't do shit like that. That makes me angry because you're not really contributing when you do that. All you're doing is taking other people's work and putting it under your own channel and trying to make money. That's not cool. That is just trying to find some schemy way of taking advantage of others. And that's why I don't like it. I don't like when people try to find cheap little schemy ways of making money in ways that take advantage of others. I believe in being an honest and ethical person and an honest and ethical businessman. I believe in treating people fair. Uh, I mean, I've, as many of you know, I had a co-host on the show in the past, and I always treated that person extremely fair. There was no unfairness for me in that situation. Because that is what I believe in. I believe in being fair to people. I believe in leading by example. I believe that you can do a lot more good for some... I'm sorry, you can do a lot more good for other people by living your own life the right way and making good decisions because people are going to observe what you're doing. And you can be a role model. You can set the example for others. You don't have to give money to homeless people to do good in this world. You can do a lot of good by just working on yourself, by pushing yourself, by having a good positive attitude, and by just not being a dick. (laughs) And that can be hard. It's hard for me sometimes. (laughs) But (sighs) really... I just want all of you guys to awaken your inner power. I want you to really think hard and I want you to get in touch with your intuition and I want you to get in touch with the voice in your heart and I want you to really figure out why you're here and I want you to really point yourself in the right direction. You need to get in touch with your higher self. If you can do that, If you can listen and wait for yourself to have that feeling in your heart, when you are thinking of something, you are on the right track. You will feel your heart kind of 
leap a little bit or, or jump a little bit. And what that is, is that is your innermost feeling letting you know that you are headed in the right direction. Whatever you're thinking of, whatever's on your mind is right. You are pointed in the right direction. Your compass is pointed in the right direction. And I want all of your compasses to be pointed in the right direction. Because that is exactly how we are going to make this world a better place. It starts on the individual level. It means becoming free from all of the chemicals in our water and in our air and in our food. It means being free from not only that type of pollution, but the mental pollution out there, the mind control, the endless amounts of trash that bombards your brain trying to control you and trying to make you pray for others. There's quite a bit of that out there, isn't there? I want you guys, I want you guys to think. I want you to get your compass pointed in the right direction. Have you seen the movie The Golden Compass? That movie was garbage, right? But everybody has their own golden compass. And if you can get it pointed in the right direction, you'll do all right. And maybe you don't even have to do anything. Maybe you just need to live your life and let the events unfold. And you can become who you are meant to be. But one thing that's very important is that you do not give up. Never give up. Never give up. You can, let's say you're working at a job and they fire you. You know what? You're way better off getting fired than quitting. Because if you quit, you're quitting on yourself. And you're going to have to pull yourself back up eventually. But if you get fired, you just move on to the next thing. Easy breezy. No big deal. Don't ever let them have all the power. If you feel me there. <sighs> Don't you love my... <sighs> Anyways. So, how many of you out there have been watching Iron Fist? Anybody at all? I just started watching that. I, I watched all the episodes on Netflix. Holy crap, is that a good show? Daredevil was good. Luke Cage was good. Iron Fist is better than both of them. If you like martial arts, if you like that original Kung Fu show or Kung Fu The Legend Continues, you are really going to like this show. This show is badass. It has some of the best martial arts fighting scenes that I've ever seen anywhere. And the story is great. And the main character's name is Danny. That's that's my name. So, so sometimes I'll dance around and pretend that I'm the Iron Fist. Oh, yeah, I did want to bring something else up. All of you lovely people out there, you know you can help with this show in many ways. You can send me music. You can send me funny little clips to play. And, and once again, before I move on, I'm so sorry for not opening up the phone lines. I just was not even thinking. And things have been so screwy lately. I've been so busy. My schedule's been so packed. But I will always make time for the show. I will always make time for you. But anyways, if you want to help with the show, you can. And when you help with this show, you help me quite a bit. There's some of you out there that have helped tremendously. So I want to give a shout out to Todd the Bod. He's helped with this show tremendously. His buddy Al has also helped quite a bit. And, and shout out to Sherry as well, who is always sending me guests, who's always sending me questions, who's always calling in and just making this show a big part of her life and always trying to help. All three of those people have been so helpful. And, and a lot of you other people, too. I don't want to leave anybody out, but you know, I just wanted to talk about those three because they've, they've done so much, almost on a, a daily or weekly basis, so... So I do appreciate that. And if you do like the show and you want to get involved with it, you can. Because it just helps me. If you want to write some music, if you want to come up with some kind of funny clip to play, if you have questions for the guests, if you go to the schedule, you don't always have to call in 
if you have a question, you can send, you can email it to me. You can send it to me on Twitter. You can go on the end of days form and leave a message there. I'm so sorry that I have not been working on that form. Like I said, I've just been so busy and let's face it. I have to make ends meet in order to do the show. And, and the more I'm able to make ends meet, the more I can devote to this show. So that does have to come first. Unfortunately, I'm a working man. I'm not trying to make a living off of this show. I feel like that would be awful. It would completely corrupt the whole message because it would turn into trying to sell penis pills and MREs and survival jackets and stuff like that. Survival jackets. What's that? But you know what I mean? I don't want to, I don't want to be a Viagra pimp or a guy like Alex Jones. Who's just selling stuff, selling this or that. I'm not looking for that. I'm not looking to sit at home all day and do a podcast. I mean, God, that, can you imagine that? Like, that's your whole life is doing a podcast. I mean, if you're on the radio, that's one thing. Even then, I, all I've ever heard is how much radio sucks. If you listen to Howard Stern, he's always saying radio sucks. And he always has all these awful horror stories of working in these shitty markets and the managers abusing him and stuff like that. It's just awful. It's awful. But Howard, he is one of my heroes. Art Bell is one of my heroes. And lately I've been listening to a lot of Danny Bonaducci. He's local here in Seattle. He actually lives in Seattle and he he's on, a, what is it, KZOK? 102.5 here locally. You local people know what I'm talking about. I used to hate Danny. I used to think he was such a douchebag. I used to call him Danny Bon douchebag. <laughs> like I'm sure a lot of other people do or have. But okay, so the reason I didn't like him was because he was just such a freak. I mean, he was always doing drugs or getting in some kind of crazy drama situation and he's such a little tough guy. I just I couldn't stand him, but I started listening to his show in the morning because he's on the classic rock station and I started getting addicted and slowly I started really liking Danny Bonaducci. Now I, I love the guy. I always want to listen to him. He cracks me up. He's got a really good co-host named Sarah and they have a good show. I, I respect, I respect that show and I listen to it and you know, you guys out there, you know that I am picky about my radio. You know that that I will not listen to just anything. You know that I won't listen to any of these paranormal shows that are just, you know, boring interview shows where they show no personality and they just sit there and ask questions like this and they stock up to the guests. I don't do that, do I? I hope not. And you know what's funny is people have tried to tell me that I suck before like certain bitter individuals. And that just makes me laugh. Like you're not going to convince me that I suck. That's so funny. I mean, of course I'm good. I know that I am. I'm I'm not bragging about it. I just know there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, it's self-confidence. I know that I can get on this mic and I can go and it didn't happen all at once. It took me what, five years to kind of figure it out. I was, just like anybody else when I started. I could barely talk. It's like, uh, uh, silence for five minutes. Uh, uh, silence for seven minutes. Uh, uh. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's just long pauses there. And everybody starts out like that. So if you are thinking of getting in podcasting, you should. You absolutely should. I don't ever attack individuals. I don't attack shows or anything like that. That's rude. I don't do that. But most of them do suck. And the reason they suck is the people doing them, they just don't get enough practice. They're not really thinking it through. They're not taking it seriously. You, you gotta, you gotta get good. I, I mean, I have a lot of room for improvement. I'll admit, I need to keep pushing myself to get better at this. I don't have any illusions about that. I feel like I'm good, but I could be 10 times better. I totally know that. And, 
anybody who wants to get into this, you're going to have to realize that going in. But you can do things to shorten the process. One thing I can recommend is giving your show a little bit of structure. I don't always have a ton of structure here, but it does make a difference because if you have a plan, you're not sitting there freaking out, wondering what the heck you're going to do next. It makes sense, right? But... You know, my computer is acting really weird right now. I hope all this is getting recorded. I better get off the air because it's acting weird. I'm going to stop the show right now. I do apologize, everybody, but my computer is just on the fritz. So I, I, I need to take care of that, care of this and figure out what the heck's going on. All right. Oh, and all of a sudden it starts working normal again. I, I don't know what the hell that was. That was really weird. I hope I'm not getting hacked or something. But, okay, looks like I don't have to bell just just yet. Lucky for you. Ooh, somebody's calling. What's this? Hello? Evening, Daniel. Hey, Al, what's going on? How you doing that? Uh, I'm tired, but I'm pushing through and trying to rage into the night like I always do. You know, I think everybody's tired these days. I think it's the chemtrails. Yeah, yeah, or it could be the 50 cups of coffee I drank this morning. No, I mean, everybody seems to be tired all the time lately. I think it's chemtrails. Uh, yeah, I, I believe that this thing that we're living in, this matrix, we talked about it last time, uh, it's an energy farm. It's taking our energy from us, and I don't, mean this or that type of energy. I mean energy. It literally makes you tired. Mm-hmm. Could be all the RF in the air, too. Yeah, yeah, there are some strange Everybody's signals. Got Wi-Fi. You got all the radio stations, the TV stations, the people on uh, other radios, and then you got all these Wi-Fi everywhere. Yeah, I know I've been getting messed with. I've already had one of my shows interfered with. I've been getting all kinds of screeching and beeping in my head. I've been getting weird harmonics directed at me at nighttime when I'm trying to sleep, all kinds of stuff. And the more I do this show and the more time passes, the more it seems to intensify. Hmm. You know, when I go to bed at night, I put music on. I used to listen to Coast to Coast, but it kind of started getting boring after a while. All the guests that I listened to back at the beginning knew what they were really talking about, but then all the guests I got lately are just uh, second generation. Yeah. So they don't they, really know. They don't know as much as the people. They're researcher, they've only been researching the subject like 10, 15 years, whereas the people before had 20, 30 years under their belt. Well, they have that Linda Moulton Howell on there just all the time. I'm so sick of her. Like, oh, God, like, again? Is she going to talk about crop circles again? Or cattle mutilation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's either one or the other. What are we going to talk about now? Cattle mutilations you know, recently or crops? I saw a service. video of a cow being sucked up into the sky and went through some flash of light. Was it real or was it some CGI fake stuff? I don't know. It was on a UFO uh, Facebook page I'm a member of. Yeah, I'll have to look for that. There's a lot of good videos on YouTube. There's a lot of fakes, too. Like, I just saw a fake video of a giant. It was supposed to be a Google Earth image, and it was supposed to be a giant, but it looked super fake, like somebody just drew it in there. I've seen videos, or I've seen pictures on videos of uh, giant skeletons. How do you feel about that? Do you feel that there was once giants walking across the Earth? Uh, how about they visited the Earth? Yeah, that could be, too. The Anunnaki were said to be giants. Well, I heard about a cave in the Grand Canyon that had a nine-foot-tall mummies with long red hair and two rows of teeth instead of one row like we have. And I believe that's who the Anunnaki were. Yeah, very possible. Or those giants might have been hybrids of the, the Anunnaki. Skeleton. Well, some of the skeletons I saw were, were like 20 feet tall, not nine. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that I heard the Anunnaki one had nine feet. These were other beings. Do you say they were 20 feet tall? 
I've seen skeletons of 25 and 35 foot tall human skeletons. Holy crap. Being unearthed with with people the people that were unearthing and sitting next to them. Yeah, there was. Well, the public Smithsonian had a whole bunch of those skeletons and they destroyed them. There was a Roman emperor and I forget what the heck his name was. I think it was uh, Maximus or something like that, or that might have been his son. But the guy was eight feet tall or eight foot six. Well, that's not unusual today even. They're good basketball players. Yeah, like Shaquille O'Neal. He's huge. Yeah, what happens every now and then? Okay, this guy's name was Maximus Thrax, and he was eight foot six. That's pretty tall, but how, how tall is Andre the Giant? He's like seven foot what? Uh, seven, seven foot four, I think. And was that dude back in the 50s that grew real tall? Yeah, I, I love Andre the Giant. He he was in that movie Princess Bride. Yeah, he was one of my favorite wrestlers. I used to watch him back in the day. Oh, you watched he Andre the WWF. Giant? Yeah, when WWF was real young and in, in its infancy. I didn't know you were back a wrestling early, fan. Well, I liked him back in the early 80s, but then when they started the cage matches, it started getting a little hokey. I used to, when I was in high school, I used to watch local wrestling on a local station up in Wyoming. And in San Jose, too, back in the 70s. Do I used you, to watch wrestling back then. Are you into any sports or anything like that? Do you follow baseball or football or anything? Nah. Those are just Illuminati distractions to keep people distracted. You don't, you don't enjoy a uh, ball game at all? Nah, playing it. Yeah, sure. I just don't care to watch it. I've heard that the team names have some kind of mind control purpose. Like when you when you hear about the the Giants or the Bears, like for some reason they want you to think of Bears. Hey, there's a reason they're called the Washington Wizards. Oh yeah, there you go. There's a reason behind that. You said you saw Reptilian before, right? Uh, no, I've seen a shadow person, though. Oh, that's right. One night, one night in California, I was asleep, and I woke up and saw a sil- uh, human-like silhouette, but it was completely black in the center. You couldn't see through it at all. It had little purple uh, sparklies, or like little uh, purple sparkly explosions inside it all over the place. Yeah, I've seen them a few times when I was kind of in, in half sleep. And one time I actually ran up and tried to punch one, but my fist just went through it. It just disappeared, and it was like it was gone. Huh. Here's a good one for you. One night I woke up here in Salt Lake about 15, 20 years ago, somewhere around there. I was. Uh, I woke up and I saw this looked like a sunflower with an eyeball in the center of it instead of sunflower seed. Oh shit! That's disgusting. I wouldn't want to see that. It was like an opaque white, and it was like oh, it was just like this eyeball looking at me that had these like flowers on the petals on the side of it, like a sunflower. Ugh. And then when I woke up and saw it, it slowly backed away and it disappeared through my wall. Oh god, that's freaky as hell. Later, but a few weeks later, I saw the same thing at the foot of my bed in another location. I saw the whole beam. It was like the like the eyeball in the center with the sunflower petals for the around it, but then uh, below it looked like seaweed draping down below, or like paper strips flowing. Yeah, that's really weird. That yeah, someone told me it was the Holy Ghost. Yeah, I don't know that. That sunflower with the eyeball thing—that's that sounds like something from uh, Star Wars, like when they're trapped in that that garbage com- compactor and that eyeball thing's <laughs> popping up. Yeah, no, it wasn't creepy like that. I felt at ease around it. That's why I thought it was nice. Yeah, that's that's entirely it freaky. Didn't, didn't creep me out. Didn't creep me out because I felt comfortable with it. Ugh. I could not get comfortable with a sunflower eyeball. 
No, just no, just like if you're looking at a sunflower and had an eyeball in the middle of it. Which is just how I can describe it. I'd have to draw it to actually get a better pick, uh, description of it. Well, earlier our our guest, my guest, he was talking about the uh, Hebrew, the Kabbalah stuff, and he talked about the golem. I, I wonder if we could make a golem, like we could make a big clay man and somehow bring him to life. That would be pretty fun. I'm sure if you were advanced enough evolutionary on the evolutionary scale, you could it'd be possible. Kind of like Doctor Frankenstein, where he goes and he digs up all those graves and he just stitches the body parts together and somehow he brings them to life with lightning or somehow. I was more thinking like an advanced civilization that has wonderful technology that we would consider magic today. Just like a hundred years ago, you'd consider the television and the radio magic and witchcraft. Well, supposedly the Illuminati got all that stuff, and they're even cloning people now. Well, I saw a uh, video of a lamb inside a plastic pouch where they were growing a sheep outside of the womb in, a, in an artificial womb. Ugh. When I posted on my Facebook page, I asked the question... Uh, I wonder how many humans have tried this on. Okay, Al, let me throw a hypothetical situation at you. Let's say you're sitting on, in your living room, like you're sitting on the couch, you're having a beer, you're relaxing. The doorbell rings. You get up, you open the door, and it's Al. It's you looking at you in the eye. What do you do? Uh, well, first thing, I look through my peephole and see who it is first. If I don't know who it is, I don't answer the door. But you would know who it is. It'd be you. Yeah, probably. Oh, interesting you say that because I have seen other me's. You have seen other you's? Yeah. Wow. Time when I was in California, I was at a beach and I saw, I was hanging out with my buddies and one of my buddies says, hey, dude, what are you doing over there walking across the beach? And I looked over and dude looked just like me. Like just like you or similar? Looked, looked just like me walking down across the beach. I should have went down and said, hey, dude. Was it a guy that just looked like you, or was it some kind of clone? I'm thinking it was a decoy. What's that? Somebody else that looks like me, but to distract away from me perfectly. Like when I was battling the Illuminati in the last 15 years. Would you ever try to fight your clone? Uh... I got no reason to fight any of my clones. There's no reason for them to even show up on my doorstep. Well, you have to fight your clone because there can only be one real you. Ah, uh, but see, science fiction says that your clone has all your memories. And I don't, memories are based on experience, not genetic or uh, chemical storage. Yeah, yeah, that's that's entirely possible. What okay, Al, what is the weirdest thing that you've seen, period? I mean you see some weird shit. What is the weirdest hands down, what is the weirdest thing that you have seen? I was in my room one time doing something and uh the keyboard on my computer was at a slant where my screen wasn't. And I looked over at my synthesizer keyboards and they were sitting at a like uh, about a thirty degree angle also. I was warping time and space. Oh, that's that's kind of scary. You were warping time and I space. Yeah, I can't tell you how I was doing it, but yeah. Yeah, that's very odd, but I do not disbelieve you. I, I think that you are telling me the truth. Who knows what the mind is capable of? It is said that we are all potential gods. Well, I was in a trance state when I was doing it, too. Maybe you were freeing yourself from the Matrix or evolving. Well, it's happened to me twice. That's how I know it's, uh, that it wasn't just some one-off. It's happened to me twice. But I was doing something like... Um, the last time it happened, I was communicating with one of Eisenhower's granddaughters. You know, you know the, the first future. thing the first thing that you described where you were seeing the stuff, like, warp around... I mean, this this might come to you as a surprise, but that's actually happened to me before. What? 
pretty much exactly what you describe. You're staring at something and it starts warping around. Oh, I wasn't staring at it. I was doing something else and I just looked up and what the hell? Well, I was I, in I, trance state, but I was, I, was, I, was, I was focused on something. I was kind of like uh, bending time. Yeah, something similar happened to happened to me. It's hard to describe, but very similar. So I believe you. And, I got no reason to lie about it. There's something that happened to me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I I don't I don't think that you are lying because, like I said, I had pretty much a similar exact thing happen where I was looking at something and all of a sudden it started to move around like I was bending time and space. Actually, you're probably using your telekinetic abilities if it was moving on you. I have no idea, but it scared the living shit out of me. And I've Ah, never talked about it on this show before. See, that's where your problem lied is it scared you. Yeah, I mean, I admit it. I'm just being honest. It's That type of stuff scares the shit out of me. Right, or whereas if you embrace it, then you learn how to focus it. What's this thing about... You, what's this thing about... The trick is you have to learn to use it for good and not evil, not personal. What's this thing you're talking about, Eisenhower's granddaughters? I was on a little journey, and I ran into... Uh, I was up into YouTube, and I found some people that were talking about being in the future. I think I, I get on YouTube and I sometimes I get on YouTube and I find these weird metaphysical uh, videos. Yeah, I've uh, I've watched one of my guests, Alfred, the guy that came on the show that was being interfered with. He interviewed Eisenhower's granddaughter, so I wonder if that's the same person. She was talking about some pretty trippy stuff. It probably was. You know, the, one I, the video I was watching was a split screen with her on one side and him on the other. It might have been the same guy. Yeah, that that's probably it. that that he's a pretty good uh, he's a pretty good researcher. I really enjoyed having him on. But Al, I do well, have to go, unfortunately, because I'm I'm so tired and I've been working so hard all week. So I'll have to touch yeah, bases with you later. All right. Any Have last thing you want to say? No. Help was said. Okay, awesome. I'll talk to you again. All right, here again. Bye. And there you have it. That was Al. I had to cut that call a little bit short. Usually, usually I'll shoot the shit with Al just a little bit more, but I'm so tired. I'm so tired. It's It hurts. It hurts. You know... When you're tired, don't think of it like you're tired. Just think, hey, I'm just recharging my batteries. If you think of it that way, it'll help you. Uh, I'm so tired that I, I literally can't even think. So I better draw things to a close. I do want to remind all of you to listen to this show. Saturday night. I'm, I'm going to try to move everything back to Saturday nights just because of the way my schedule is. And I was doing shows on different days each time, but I want to get back to having a show same day, same time. So we can have some sort of routine. So you guys can actually show up to the chat room and, and show up ready to make your calls and all of that. It, we've, I've kind of had to get away from that because my schedule has been so screwed up. But I'm going to get back on track, get back to doing a show on Saturday nights consistently. I think that's really the way to do it. So we'll be starting a little bit later instead of 745, probably 830 or even 845. I hope that's not too late for some of you guys out there, you guys and gals. That's that's another thing I love about doing this show is when I... When I created NinjaShoes.net, you know, the mixed martial arts forum, MMA is really a guy thing. It's mostly like 95% men that are into it, if not 99, 
especially back when I started it, which was before the Ronda Rousey thing or the Misha Tate thing or any of that. So it was pretty much just all guys with the occasional, uh, occasional girl popping in. So it was always a big sausage party, sausage party. <laughs> but I love the fact that End of Days Radio has an equal split of male and female listeners. I love the fact that something I created is reaching both men and women, as well as people of all ages and all races. I really like being able to reach everybody and having a well-rounded fan base of people that crave information, that crave knowledge, that crave the awakening. (laughs) Oh, man. I, I do really like that, though. I, I love the fact that there's so many female listeners out there. And I think that that is just the nature of the paranormal. It tends to attract both sexes to it. And you guys out there that are having trouble with the ladies, well, maybe you should go ghost hunting. Or maybe you should go look for Bigfoot, because a lot of women are into that. If you want to really turn a woman on, take her Bigfoot hunting. Just just hope that Bigfoot doesn't steal her away with his big, hairy you-know-what. You got to watch out for that. But if you like End of Days Radio, if you like listening to me, the D.A.N., the All-American Man, you can stop by endofdaysradio.com. Subscribe on iTunes. Subscribe on Google Play, subscribe on Stitcher, subscribe on YouTube, follow me on Twitter, and of course, you can email me, danielendofdaysradio at gmail.com. You can friend me on Skype or contact me on Skype, that's ninjashoes777. You can also join the forum at endofdaysradio.com, just click forum. And that is a community that is always growing. Uh, What else is there? Oh, don't forget to go back and listen to the last show. Had a special anonymous guest on. And that show is all about the freeyourbrain.org website, which has had a major influence on so many of us. And as for what is ahead, well, you know what? There's nothing on the schedule at the moment, but there are quite a few people that I am planning on reaching out to. So hopefully we'll be back here next Saturday night. I want to make it a really special show. So if I have to skip next Saturday and do it the next week, then I'll do that because I believe in quality over quantity. And I believe in putting together a good show. Tonight went great. We had a great guest on. We covered a lot. I wish I would have had some new stories prepared. I wish I would have had some more stuff prepared. But I think the strength of the guest tonight is enough. So, shout out to all the fans out there who love to hear me ramble on and on. (laughs) Okay, enough's enough. Let's let's draw things to a close before I, I completely lose my mind. That usually happens once I start heading into the later hours, especially if I've been working hard all day. What was I saying earlier? That's right. I am just a blue-collar guy like all of you. I work for a living. I'm not some freaking freeloader. I'm not some freaking hippie. I will work my butt off, and I will work every day. I will work hard, so know that I am like you. And I am a working person who has to make ends meet. And this show is really special to me, but it's not a source of income. I don't ever want it to be because that would ruin it. Absolutely. But if you like donating, (laughs) feel free to donate to the show. Just go to endofdaysradio.com. I do appreciate your donations so much because it helps pay for the server costs and stuff like that. It just helps. But you don't have to. I just like for you to listen. Don't feel pressured to donate. That's not what I'm going for. Just you can if you want to. And I don't need the money, but it does help. 
so I'm not begging, but if you want to donate, I'm very, very grateful to you. And if you just want to shoot me an email or ask a question or make a suggestion, that's fine too. I'm always open to suggestions. Oh, <laughs> before I go, it's so funny because I was joking. I was joking. I don't know when it was. It was quite a few episodes ago, but I was talking about how I didn't want to have a new co-host or anything like that because of, you know, the bad experience. And all of a sudden I started getting all these emails from people like, Hey, I know you said you didn't want to have a co-host, but I'm such and such. And I, I could be a good co-host for you for this or that reason. And, Oh man, that's so awesome of you guys to want to do something like that, to want to come on this show and join me. That makes me feel good because I know that, you see a value in this show. So I really thank you for that. But instead of bringing on a co-host on this show, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just recommend that you guys go start your own shows, start your own show because you don't need me. You don't need me to be here. I, I know you probably imagine yourself being on this show, like joking around with me and, you know, just having an awesome time. And I'm not saying that that wouldn't happen, but I think that people out there that are interested in it, I really think that you would be happier doing your own show because then you can do whatever you want with it. You have full creative freedom. Like I have now, I don't have to deal with anybody's difference of opinion anymore. That's not something that is very fun when you're just doing a free podcast on your own time and you, you have to sit there and have a power struggle with somebody that, you know, thinks they know it all and blah, blah, blah. It's, it's really frustrating. So just start your own show. You will thank me for it when you actually do it. And if you want advice from me or you just want to talk to me or you want to call in this show, that's fine. You can even call into this show and promote your show. I don't really care. I'm not like some freaking competitive moron. I've helped so many people start their own shows already. I'm always on Bell Gab giving people advice. I'm always telling people what equipment to use and how to get started, blah, blah, blah. The more the merrier, right? It's not like we're dialing for dollars here. It's not like it matters. The more people out there broadcasting, the better. Because it's not easy. It is not easy. It takes a lot of hard work. That's why I don't sit here and criticize individuals or try to bring people down or anything like that. I, I like to bring people up. I'm not into putting people down. I'm not into the mean little, you know, little high school social circles of bullying and stuff like that. The old show was just, it was too, too much of that. And it was just awful. Just the mentality. It was just. You know, it was good. It had its positive side of it, but that high school crap, it was just, I grew out of that so long ago. It, I'm sure that many of you know what I mean. And it's not to say I don't like to joke around or have a good time or be a little immature sometimes, but I'm, I'm not into making fun of people. I'm not into bringing people down. I'm not into attacking their self-esteem. I think that behavior is disgusting. Why do you have to criticize anybody else? Or, or it's not even criticism that's the problem. Why do you have to try to bring anybody else down or attack them or attack their self-esteem? Why would, why would you want to make somebody feel that way? Right? Why would you want to bully somebody? Or uh, why would you want to hurt them or debilitate them you're really only doing that for yourself. You're doing it to make yourself feel better about yourself because that's what bullies do. They pick on other kids so that they can feel better about themselves. It makes them feel like they're up one peg. One make, makes you feel like you're up one slot of the totem pole, but really you're just being a douche. I didn't really ever bully anybody when I was a kid. I don't, I never really behaved that way. I don't know why that was. Maybe I was just a nice kid. I mean, I'm sure I did it, did it a few times, like not really realizing, 
And that's something that happens. Sometimes we bust balls or make fun of somebody and we don't really realize what kind of damage that we're doing. But I think that we all sort of know on some intuitive level. I, I'm not I'm not somebody that vibes with that. I, I just I'm not into putting people down. I'm not into bringing people down. Because when you do that, all it does is it just shows everybody what what level of insecurity you have inside of you. That's your insecurity. If you have to put other people down, that's your insecurity. When you, when you are so insecure that you can't even show your face, that you have to hide, that you have to constantly put down others because you can't stand yourself, you got issues. And if you're a grown-ass man and you're acting that way, you got some real issues, buddy. I hope I don't act that way. I probably do a little bit here and there, but some people are really, really bad. Who likes strip clubs? <laughs> Let's change the topic. Who likes strip clubs? We'll save that for next time. This is Daniel. I'm your host. And I am signing out for the night. Let's hear that outro, everybody. Good night, fellas. Good night, Seattle. What was that other thing that I would say? Oh, we are the resistance. <laughs> All those kind of suck, don't they? I'll think of something. I'm still working on it. All right, let's go. Bye. Raising consciousness and awakening mankind. This is End of Days Radio.